It's my pleasure to be here today. It's my pleasure to join all of you. We have a very special panel for you this afternoon, and we're very excited. We uh, decided to entitle it Island Hopping, and of course, that means that we're going to be talking about the war in the Pacific. What I thought is that each of my friends here would tell you about a few key moments from each of those campaigns in which they participated. It is our hope that these important moments will reveal to you those unique attributes of each battle. So you can begin to kind of compare and contrast them a little bit. They, sometimes they look a lot alike, and they were very different in many ways. What I thought I'd do is we'd like to give the most time possible to each veteran to allow them to tell those stories in detail as to not get lost in too much of an introduction about them, their lives, and the huge story that the war is in their lives of many years uh, from start to finish. And that if we tried to do all that, we would begin to get a little too encyclopedic and that I wanted to carry you as much as possible to the immediacy of the moment. So what we thought we'd do is try to uh, skip some of that. Some of it's in, your, in, in the material that we provided to you, and much of it, of course, is in books. Many of these men uh, have been featured in uh, different books, and we think you can find it there. So that's what we're going to try to do this afternoon, and uh, thank you for joining us. I'd like to begin with uh, a man I am uh, pleased to call my friend. R.V. Bergen served with K Company, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, and that's the 1st Marine Division. And uh, he began his war in Melbourne, went through New Britain, Peleliu, and Okinawa. What I thought I'd do is uh, ask uh, Mr. Bergen to, to begin with what, it was, uh, what his invasion of Cape Gloucester, uh, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the, his first day on Cape Gloucester because it was so different from other invasions that we'll be talking about. Uh, Mr. Bergen. <coughs> the first Marine division landed on New Britain at, at Cape Gloucester on December the 26th, 1943. And my battalion didn't land until the first day of January, so we did not have any fighting going on as we were going ashore. We moved on up the island. I don't remember exactly how far, but it uh, must have been a couple of miles. And we started to dig in that night and I hadn't seen a Jap yet. We started to dig in, and we had a Banzai charge. Well, I was a gunner on a 60 millimeter mortar, and all I had on weapon, only weapon that I had was a 45 on my side. Those Banzai charges, they came with their rifles raised in the Holland Banzai. Marine, you die. And one of them got close enough to me that I plugged him with that 45. After that day, I had me a rifle and a 45. <laughs> and we moved on in up a little bit further on the island, and we had a small aircraft plane that came in at night, just a single engine, and dropped a 100-pound bomb. And he harassed us for, oh Lord, I don't know how many days. And one night he got lucky and he dropped a, a bomb in our area where we were dug in. And my good friend Jim Burke was in a foxhole with this guy. And that bombshell or shrapnel come in and killed him. And Jim Burke called for a corpsman and he said, I waited about 10 minutes and no corpsman came, so I called corpsman again. And actually, 
I don't guess there was over five or six seconds from his first call to his second call. And I would imagine that that felt like 10 minutes to Jim. I bet Jim going over on the USS Mount Vernon going to Australia. And we have been very good friends up until today. We've kept in touch with one another. Hey, we had quite a few uh, beers at uh, Young and Jackson's there in Melbourne. And uh, what we're talking about here on Cape Gloucester, New Britain is uh, in some respects uh, the last part of the first half of the war. Not in any other way of understanding except that the Japanese uh, on Cape Gloucester were continuing to attack marine positions with different types of charges and so forth. And we saw less and less of that as the, as the battles, for the later battles uh, on different islands. And so it's interesting, uh, you were charged uh, as well uh, on Suicide Creek. Uh, another story from your time on Cape Gloucester uh, was you talked about the POW situation on Gloucester and how that came out of your own uh, very uh, difficult circumstances there. And I wondered if you could tell that story. We were sent out on patrol with a war dog, and the war dog would uh, sniff out th where the Japs were. And we ran on to, the, on, a, on our very first patrol, we ran on to a, what I call a lean to, A-frame uh, type deal that those Japs were in. And we stormed each end of that and before they could get their weapons drawn. So we, there was three, either three or four of them, and we took those three or four Japs back to the CP. And the next day we went down to check to see what had happened to them and they had given them clean socks, clean shoes, uh, new shoes, new dungarees, new underwear, the whole nine yards and we'd been wearing that same uniform and it was about half rotted off for over 30 days. So we didn't much like that. So we solved that problem. We didn't bring them any more prisoners. <laughs> The, at one time up near, near Suicide Creek, uh, there was a Jap in a tree with a, with a rifle and we couldn't locate him. And how come we didn't know he was there? They had a water can sitting close by with a canteen cup on top of it. So I walked down about 10 or 15 steps and I poured myself a drink and, and uh, I stepped back and Jim Burke was uh, kind of standing guard and watching while I got a drink. So he decided he, didn't, he wanted to drink. So he went down and just as he'd been over to, to pick up that canteen cup, that Jap shot that canteen cup right out off the top of that can. Jim took about two steps backwards and he looked at me and he said, I don't think I'm thirsty. <laughs> And we moved on up a little bit further and in that dense jungle and the, we stayed wet, I would think, at least 75% of the time, possibly 80% of the time. If you weren't wet from rain, you were wet from sweat. And my two little toenails rotted completely off during that four months that I was on New Britain. And it rained so much that the track, the tanks and the other equipment that we needed to get supplies up uh, couldn't maneuver. It was one heck of a rain. I remember one night near Hill 660, I say one night, in a 24-hour period it rained 36 inches. And let me tell you something, that's a lot of rain. We were on the... Uh, our, Later on, they called this ridge that we were trying to take, uh, Walt Ridge. Agora, I believe is the way they pronounce it, and then they named it Walt Ridge in honor of uh, Lewis Walt, who led a very uh, successful attack on that, on that ridge. And during the night, that, that night, 
uh, or before we ever went up there, well, Lonnie Howard was uh, come to me. He was from Houston, Texas. And he came to me and he said, Bergen, I have this watch. He said, if anything happens to me, I want you to have it. And, uh, and he had a couple of other items that he wanted me to have. And I said, forget it. Nothing's going to happen to you. And he said, no, no. He said, I'm serious. Uh, if anything happens to me, I want you to take, I want you to get this. And I said, hell, I'll see you at home. I'll see you back in the States. You can give it to me then. But anyway, that night, one of our artillery shells came in just a little bit low and hit a treetop and killed him and McCarthy. So I guess uh, Lonnie Howard had a premonition that he was going to get killed. That night on that, on that Walt Ridge, uh, starting about 1 o'clock, we fought off five Banzai, Banzai charges by, by daylight. And there was one Jap come in the foxhole, tried to come in the foxhole with me, and I had a bayonet on my rifle, M1 rifle. And he was so close I didn't get to shoot him, and I stuck that bayonet in the lower part of his chest all the way through his body, shot him about three times, threw him over my shoulder out of the foxhole area. And then, just before daylight, another Jap was trying to come in, and I did shoot him with my 45. Uh, he was within about four, three to four feet from me when he fell. So it was a, it was a long night. Then after that campaign was over, K Company had 21 Marines killed in that campaign. I don't remember how many we had. And then we left the island on May the 4th that was four months on, full, full four months on that island. We left the island and went to Pavuvu in the Russell Islands. Well, the guys that had come in as a replacement battalion, they thought that was the hell hole of all earth. But they had it pretty well cleaned up. They had the rotten coconuts out. The rats are pretty well thinned down. The cra uh, land crabs was not near as many as they were when they first arrived. We had company streets. And they weren't, uh, didn't have gravel on them or anything yet, so they were still pretty muddy. But I had just come out of four, four months combat, and I didn't think that place was all that bad myself. But they did. They, they had just come home sleeping on, between Mama's white sheets and run into something like that, and it was really something else. These guys on New, on New Britain, uh, I want to go back and tell you this. The, the Jap tied theirself up in the tree, and when that guy shot that canteen half off the top of that water can, I got Norman with his 30 caliber machine gun to come up there and spray that, those trees, and he came in and, and sprayed that, and he killed that Jap. That Jap fell out, I say, uh, he broke loose, and, and he was still hanging, he was still hanging on to it. He also had his rifle tied on to it. You know, I got to thinking to myself, that rascal may be still hanging there. That skeleton with that rusty rifle there, uh, that would be something to go back to see. <laughs> but anyway, after we re received more replacements and more troops and more training, we sailed for Peleliu. And the beach landing was absolutely something else. It was a lot of men killed going in, a lot of men wounded. We made it through that day, and the next morning everybody was thirsty. It was about anywhere from 110 to 120 degrees on that island. We had two canteens of water, which was a pint each. And most guys were out of water by mid-afternoon. And the next morning they brought in some water in five-gallon cans. And the water in those cans had been drained from gasoline drums. And the gasoline had never, gasoline and oil drums, and the gasoline and the oil had never been cleaned out of those big drums. And I, honest to God, I think if that was so strong that you could take a drink of that and blow your breath and strike a match, and you would have had a flame. <laughs> but we, um, a lot of the men got sick on that. And uh, the next morning, they, we walked across the airstrip. 
And folks, that's the longest walk I've ever had in my life. I have never felt in my whole life as helpless as I did walking across that airstrip. Man, you felt naked, and they were shooting their machine guns, they were shooting their rifles and throwing in mortars. Artillery shells fall every once in a while. I don't know how in the world we all didn't get killed. But we didn't. We made it in and uh, went on there for a few days. We landed on September the 15th, and on September the 28th, we were ordered to, to go to Nicosivas. And Nicosivas was a little island with an airstrip on it, and we'd been receiving artillery fire from them at night onto the, on the mainland. So we moved in, we set up a bunker, uh, set up beside of a bunker, the 60 mortars, and Sledge, the one that wrote the old breed with, at uh, Peleliu in Okinawa, he said, Bergen, there's Japs in that, in that pill box. And I said, no, Saunders said, that, the first sergeant Saunders said there wasn't any Japs in there. He said, no damn well, Bergen, there's Japs in there. I can hear him chattering. So I went up to the side of the deal that had a vent on it, and there was a Jap stick with his face stuck up in that vent. And I shot him with my carbine about three times in the face before we could get it down. And then I just stuck the, the rifle barrel into that vent and unload, finished unloading that clip. And man, you're talking about, I just like a, a kick in a beehive. Those guys really came alive in there then. And then I don't, I don't know how many it was. They had a machine gun in there. They had their rifles. They had hand grenades. And they'd fire that machine gun out of there every little bit. They'd throw hand grenades out. Then they'd fire their rifles out of that thing. And I decided my, I don't know where my lieutenant was, and my, my sergeant and the other squad leader was up running the telephone line up to the front, front line, which wasn't but about 50 to 75 yards up there. So I was the uh, only NCO that was with the mortar section. So I decided that something had to be done and be done quick. If we didn't, we might get the whole darn bunch killed. So I ran back to the beach about a, anywhere from 100 to 120 yards and, and got an Amtrak tank with a 75 Hauser sitting on, the, on it. And just lucky uh, Womack, Charles Womack was our flamethrower man with, with a backpack flamethrower, and he got up, I got both of them, and they came up, and the tank blew a hole in that thing with about three or four rounds of armor piercing, it was about 18 or 20 inches in diameter, and Womack used his flamethrower on them, and some of the Japs run out, but when it was all said and done, we had 21 Japs, I mean 17 Japs killed, and uh, seven inside and 10 made it outside. And we had two men wounded, not serious, they didn't have to be evacuated. And I thought we'd come out of that ordeal pretty good. One night we were sitting there on Peleliu and it was a very high cliff. I guess it was 50 to 70 feet straight down, that coral cliff. And our company had already been thinned down so thin that we didn't keep two men in a foxhole, we just kept one man in a, well, we really couldn't dig a foxhole, we were just more or less up on top of the ground. Sometimes we could find some loose coral and kind of stack it up around you a little bit. And the second man down from me that night, about, I would guess that it was about one o'clock, and he crawled in, in on this guy, he was, he was his turn to have a nap. We would be an hour on and an hour off, it was his turn, turn to sleep. And that Jap sneaked in there and got set right in the middle of his belly and started choking him. He said he could feel himself choking to death. And he said everything that I, every training that I ever had went, ran through my mind. And he said I finally reached behind his neck with one hand and I gouged his eyes with two fingers and with the other hand. He broke his hold and he picked him up by the nap of the neck and the seat of the pants and threw that jap over that cliff. And folks, I'm going to tell you that that was the most blood-curdling scream that I have ever heard in my life that that jap made. And he screamed all the way to the bottom of it. 
And that same day, before all that happened that night, the guy sitting right next to him, and he wasn't sitting over just within arm lengths of him. I jab shot him right between the eyes. And I called for a corpsman, and the corpsman come and got him and carried him out. He wasn't there long. And while we were in that position right there, we would pick Japs, try to pick Japs off as they'd come outside to have a cigarette or try to pick one of us off, and we, we would pick a few of them off with our rifles from time to time. And the flies absolutely were unbelievable. And the stench, the dead Japs that were around, they didn't have time to take, take, come and get them and take them off. And the flies were so thick, I'm telling you that they would, when you threw a, a rock or a can or anything into a, a brush pile where they were at, they would rise and they would li literally make a shadow where the, they were that thick. And they were those big green blow flies and it was they were really something else mr bergen what i'd like to do we've we've talked a little bit about cape gloucester which started in late 43 and now we've talked uh, quite a bit about peleliu which as you know was september of 44 and mr bergen's war wasn't over yet he had to go on to okinawa and i wondered if uh, you might share a, a story from okinawa one that would help us understand how different that battle was from the two before I fought, in, I fought in three different battles. I fought on Cape Gloucester, and Peleliu, and Okinawa, and all three of them was as different as day and night. The Japs on Peleliu were in, more or less in the island. They had over 500 caves that were uh, on that island, one cave large enough to house 1,500 soldiers. They did not banzai charge. On, Pel on New Britain, they did. So after the Battle of Peleliu, we moved on to Okinawa. And we did hit very little resistance whenever we uh, landed. Uh, Colonel McDougal, Colonel G Gustafsson, 3rd Battalion Commander, he took about 10 steps out from the boat, and he got shot through the arm. He turned right around and went back on the same ship that brought us in, and he was the first casualty of the 5th Regiment on Okinawa. Okinawa was one little ridge in one valley, and no doubt about it, you had to take every ridge as you went along. The first month that we were there, we, we didn't see very, very little action. Just a sniper would come along every once in a while, and you'd have to go get, and you'd have to take care of him. And one morning we were waiting to go to another island, the K Company was waiting to go to, uh, to another island and uh, confront the Japs on that island. And we were standing around, you know, the Marines stand around a lot. In fact, the Venice the Marines practiced that for the three years that I was there. They practiced hurry up and wait. And they were good at it. We were standing around waiting, and I heard a grenade spoon fly off of a grenade. And about the time that I really made up my mind that it was a grenade spoon, it, it said, pop, you know. And I said, who's the stupid son of a bitch that pulled that grenade pin? And my lieutenant, fresh out of OS, OCS in the States and hadn't been there but just very few days. He said, oh, I did. He said, but I took all the powder out of it. And I said, well, how damn stupid can you get for crying out loud? But anyway, he was, he was a good man. He was just green. He didn't have any experience. Then we moved on in to a position where we tried to get go across that valley and take a ridge, the next ridge, and we had been knocked off of it for two mornings. And we'd get out in the valley and they'd wound somebody and we couldn't go any further and we'd have to have smoke grenades to get us out of there and back it up again. The next morning we tried it and we didn't make it. 
So I was observer on that 60 millimeter motor, and I decided that there was something there on that ridge that somebody wasn't seeing because that artillery would literally rake that thing over every morning before he moved out. But the shells would hit the edge of the ridge and not do any damage. And if they raised it, their sights just a little bit, the shell would go off in the valley on the other side of it. So I zeroed the guns in on it, and uh, I started one gun in, at the left and traversed it to the right. I moved one gun up 15 yards and started it on the right and traversed it to the left. And I used the third gun starting in the middle from the left and traversed to the right, down and then back up. And I ordered 20 rounds per gun on, on, on that mission. And my lieutenant, he said, uh, no, we're not going to fire that mission. We don't have the ammunition. And I said, yeah, we're going to fire that mission. And so he and I finally had a few words over the telephone. And whenever I finally told him, I said, uh, Scotty, if you're going to do the damn observing, you get your ass up here on the front line where you can see what's going on. Anyway, he said, well, Bergen, if we fire all of those rounds, we won't have a damn round left. And I said, the first platoon, second platoon, third platoon, CP, and mortar section was all hooked up on those sound phones, and you could talk to everybody at one time if you like. And he, I said, CP, and they said, yep. I said, this Bergen, can you get me 100 rounds of HE up here? He, pronto, he said, yep, it's on its way. And I said, fire at my command. I got the zero, I got the gun zeroed in, and I, we began firing, and we fired 20 rounds per gun. That was 60 rounds of HE on those japs on that position. And I got to thinking it was kind of over to our left, a couple of hundred yards from where I was doing the observing. And I got to thinking, I'm going to go up there and see what happened. Well, I did. I went up there, and there was the, as the ridge came up like this, it immediately went down like this for about 15 to 20 feet, and then it flattened out, and there was a small road right down to the bottom of it, and then the ridge came up approximately 10, 8 to 10 feet, and then leveled out into the valley. And when I went up there, there was, I counted 53 or 57, I cannot remember which number it was, but it was either 53 or 57 Japs that we killed on that, with those 60 rounds of motors, motor shells. And we didn't have any problems at all going up that ridge after that. That's a great story, sir. And uh, RV, as you know and can tell, is a, is a, is a great storyteller. Uh, in the interest of time, we do have to move on a little bit uh, and give our other veterans a chance to talk. Um, I'd like to, uh, to uh, uh, ask uh, Clarence Wolfguts to be our next speaker. Many of you know about the Navajo Code Talkers. There was a movie made about it, and, and, uh, and rightly so. But uh, as I mentioned, at lunchtime, there are many different tribes who participated. And the ironic thing is that many of those people had uh, been trained as, as, uh, as young boys not to speak their language and not to observe their culture. And uh, so when we needed them, they stepped forward, and it's, a, it's really a great story. Uh, Clarence Wolfguff comes from South Dakota, and he is a member of the Lakota tribe. Uh, he served with the 81st Infantry Division in World War II. And uh, I wondered if he might begin. Uh, from what I understand, you did not sign up, Mr. Wolfguff, as a uh, communicator. What did, you, what did you enlist to do, sir? Mr. Wolfguff. When you signed up, did you sign up to speak Lakota? Oh, yes, I, I'm just glad to be here, sitting here, listening to people talking. You know, there is a lot of things in that, that we have to learn and, you know, study and whatever. And why we went to war, it was for the people, America, people. And uh, we love America so much that we have to do whatever we can to protect us from any aggressor coming to America, destroying our way of life. We like to be free 
You know, talk, be free, do what we have to do, be somebody. You can't be just anybody, you know, be yourself. That's the best thing that you can do in this life. We love everybody. We don't uh, say that all oh, them, the, uh, he's, he's uh, so-and-so and whatever. We don't say that. We love everybody. That's why we went through the war. And we've done whatever we could to protect it from any aggressors trying to come to America. We don't want nobody to be trying to, you know, take over our lives. We want freedom. And that was the war for, and that's what we got. And I'm just happy to be here tonight looking at people smiling, having a good time, you know. It makes me the happiest person alive today. And that's all I have to say. And I thank you for everything. Thank you, sir. Thank you much, so much, sir. Uh, well, very good. We, um, we're going to turn next to an old friend of mine uh, I've interviewed a number of times, uh, Cecil Matheny. Uh, Cecil Matheny served with the 2nd Battalion, 21st Marines, 3rd Marine Division in World War II. And uh, he came to Guam as a replacement. I wondered if you might uh, talk a little bit about what it was like to come in. Uh, Guam, uh, as you know, was fought in the summer of 44. And uh, he came uh, and joined the division after much of the fighting was over with. Well, uh, they said that much of the fight was over with, but uh, actually we killed about 10,000 Jap soldiers after I got there. So uh, <clears throat> he, he told me today that, uh, that I could talk about 15 minutes. And uh, so I don't know what we're going to do with the other 10 minutes because I can tell you everything I know in five minutes. <laughs> <clears throat> I came into Guam as a replacement. Uh, organized resistance had ceased. Uh, there were still 10,000 Japs there, but they were scattered and disorganized and not many officers left. And uh, uh, my, my battalion had pushed to the northern end of the island. And this was jungle. It wasn't part of Guam, it had open rolling hills. But where we were, were where later they built the V-29 strips that, that they were using when they were bombing Jap Jap the Japanese homeland. <clears throat> but uh, in that period of time, uh, we were still living in cup tents, but we started building uh, a permanent campsite with uh, tents with strong backs on them where you could walk into them from all four corners. And <clears throat> being uh, uh, a new man and uh, more or less a buck private in the rear ranks, uh, I got most of the details that, that the older guys didn't want. And one of those was standing guard. We had a, built a double apron barbed wire fence that surrounded a, a battalion of men. And, and this battalion's probably at full strength, about 1,000 men. Each one of us had an area that we patrolled each day and, uh, and, uh, and around this barbed wire, the double apron barbed wire fence, uh, were tied tin cans, beer cans, anything on there that if something ran into it, it made a noise. Well, you stood the guard watch, uh, more guys on watch at night than in the daytime. 
And of course, night is the worst time in the world to have to fight a war or stand guard because stumps move that shouldn't be moving and your imagination plays a lot of tricks on you. And one night <clears throat> I was standing guard and uh, it rained. It rained a lot on Guam anyway. And uh, on the island of Guam, they had a lot of magnolia trees, just like you see right here in New Orleans. <clears throat> and uh, after it rained, this water would drip off the tree and down onto the magnolia leaves, and they died and curled up. And so it made a lot of noise with the water dripping on those magnolia leaves. And I'm standing watching this tree is about 50 yards from me, and I could hear good then. And uh, <clears throat> it sounded like a whole platoon of Japanese soldiers walking around one tree. And but you know the amazing thing about it, when daylight came, I couldn't find a jail. <laughs> <clears throat> the other things that, uh, like I said, that that. Uh, well, you got the details that we had a special name we call them. But for well, some of you that don't realize, in the Marine Corps, they have a head, a head of toilet, a latrine to the Army people. And uh, we had an old first sergeant from Texas, and uh, one of my details one morning was to burn out the head. Now, the head that they had was a slit about four or five feet deep, and had toilet seats arranged over the top of it. And it was my job to go burn for sanitary purposes. And so I continued to do that. And in the meantime, I'm pouring diesel fuel down in there and burning and all of a sudden I had a wand in my hand and I held it up and it caught the top of the tent on fire. <laughs> it didn't take long, I had a lot of help with coconut leaves and everything to put it out, but before I put it out, it burned the tent to the ground. So I went back to the first sergeant and I said, Sergeant Scott, what was it you sent me to do? He said, you showed me to burn the head, I said, I did. <laughs> well, after the battle was over, sir, uh, y'all spent more time on Guam getting ready for the next, uh, the next campaign by the 3rd Marine Division, which would later turn out to be Iwo Jima in 1945. But before you went, I understood uh, part of what you did was play a little baseball. Oh, yeah. It wasn't all fighting. Uh, we would, uh, we would patrol on a daily basis, but when uh, we uh, got around to it, we had a lot of good athletes. And uh, so we organized our own baseball team, and I played on the 21st Marine team. And I think that I was the only player on the team that never had played for money. Most of the guys had been in professional baseball at some level. And uh, and I remember one in particular, uh, the Heisman Trophy winner from 1943 was a man by the name of Angelo Vitelli. And he was a football player, but he was also a good athlete. And he played on the, on the regimental team. And we had guys like Hank Bauer that played for the Yankees. He was in the 22nd Marines, and he and the 22nd Marines, they they fought on Guam with the Third Division. That's great. Uh, one of the things that interests me uh, that I'd like to hear about when you went on to Iwo Jima in 1945, the Third Marine Division, and uh, your regiment actually didn't land in the first wave. We we think a lot about the first wave, and and of course we should. And, Saving Private Ryan and other films have done a great job about talking about that moment that they hit the beach. 
I thought it was very interesting, your story that you tell about what it's like to be somebody in the later waves who actually, as they're going in, has a very clear sense of what's happening on the beach. Well, I sat here this morning and listened to Woody Williams. He was in the same regiment with me. And uh, his talk brought back a lot of memories for me, the ground swells and how rough the sea was. And we stayed in uh, Higgins Boat all one day, went back aboard the ship that night, came back the next day. And one of the things that I'll hold it against the Navy till the day I die, we had a lot of guys that was the last meal they got and two days in a row, and both of them were navy beans and cornbread. <clears throat> now, the guys that were in the 4th Division and the 5th Division, the morning that they landed, they got steak and eggs. We got navy beans and cornbread. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, the 3rd Marine Division uh, actually went to Iwo Jima as a floating reserve. And like Woody said this morning, they told us, well, it's going to be a five-day campaign. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, we take an island 30 miles long and eight miles wide, and we send one or two divisions, and here it is a little place that's not much bigger than your hand, and they got three marine divisions, and I have never seen so many ships in all my life that were there. We had been trained as jungle fighters, and so after one day, they were going to expose us to this type of fighting, and Iwo Jima, it didn't have a tree on it big enough, that not much bigger than a silver dollar or half, half dollar. It just was a barren place. It didn't look too good then, and it doesn't look too good to me now. But <clears throat> uh, to, to go there and to take this, I had my doubts. And of course, I wasn't a, I was a PFC by then. You know, I was smart. <clears throat> now, when we landed, uh, it, it was uh, on the 21st of February, which was D-Day plus two. <clears throat> and in, in that, well, the, the, the reason we didn't land before then was because the beaches were so cluttered that they didn't have a space big enough to put a Higgins boat on, on shore. They finally cleared some of it out to where we could. The first thing that I saw when I landed on Iwo Jima was a stack of dead Marines that was probably 50 yards long and stacked as high as your head. These guys had just been killed in two days. The first assignment I got when I got there uh, was to uh, go out in front of the front lines and pick up some wounded that were left from the day. And a lot of times these guys would be yelling for a corpsman, corpsman, or hey Joe, come help me. Well, that, that was a, a favorite trip, trick of the Japs to call Joe, come help me or something. It'd be a trick. But we got all of the men that were wounded, they were out of the 4th Division. We got them back and didn't lose any of our people. Several days after I'd been on the island, <clears throat> uh, we were going to move out one morning, and, uh, and there was a tank, one of our tanks, a Sherman, and it had the track blown off of it. And you know, on a good day, you might move out and move 25 yards, and on a bad day, you might back up three yards. But this tank was there, 
they started, the Japanese started shelling us. And when they did, I was close enough to the tank that I started running and I dived underneath it. And I had a VAR on and a bandolier a belt full of ammo that was about this thick, so it caught and I had to take it off and I climbed under this tank and I started shoveling with my, my little shovel. And by then, uh, my assistant B. Harmon had come and he got under there and we both started shoveling and we piled dirt out around the tracks and uh, around the end of it. And finally, we had it deep enough to where he and I could sit down underneath the tank. And I, I decided, you know, this is not a bad place. I think I'll just stay here till the war's over. <laughs> they, they couldn't hit me from up side. They couldn't come at me from the downside. And I had enough dirt but around the tracks they couldn't get at me sideways. So I stayed over there all day. And the next morning, my good first sergeant came by and he heard this whiskey voice of mine. And he says, Matheny, is that you? And I said, yeah. He said, get your ass out from under there. He said, I had you listen to this in action for three days. <laughs> so my theory about Iwo Jima it was a horrible place, and uh, <clears throat> but you know, if uh, we weren't trained for that fighting, the other guys were trained for it. They weren't doing any better than we were, because I came to the conclusion that if you go get shot at, it doesn't matter whether the guy's in a tree or in a cave. He's shooting at you. It's serious business. Uh, I understand that while you were on Iwo Jima uh, going after the Japanese in their bunkers that you were wounded. Uh, this was uh, a day or two after they raised the flag. And incidentally, uh, a young man that wrote the book about flags, my father's, he's here. And I've met him on several occasions, James Bradley. And I went to see the movie the day it came out in Jackson, and and it, it's a little gory, but it follows the book, and his book takes care of six men. It doesn't tell you about the strategy of the battle of this side or the other, but it's about the life of six men, and it's a good book. And if none of you have read the book or seen the movie, I suggest you see it. But. <clears throat> The day or two after they raised the flag, uh, we were clearing out a Japanese film. <clears throat> it's uh, like I said earlier, uh, everybody in that boat is scared. But you, you just don't want the next guy to tell you to know how scared you are. And, uh, and it, it is kind of like going into a football game, the first time you get tackled or hit, then you kind of settle down and get into the routine of things. But uh, I, don't, I don't think it's, there's an easy way uh, to fight a war, and particularly from the standpoint of being in the infantry. It's, it's not too good. I always thought of Mr. Bergen uh, after Peleliu, which is like Iwo Jima, just a horrendous battle. And there were many, Tarawa, and the Army, of course, served in many uh, very difficult battles. But the, the Peleliu invasion was as bad as it got. And after that, then their next invasion was the invasion of Okinawa. And when you read E.B. Sledge's book and other books about what it was like to be in the 1st Marine Division after going to Peleliu, and now you're going to invade an island the Japanese consider part of their home islands. The expectation there, uh, the fear that must have been generated, 
I don't know how they dealt with it myself. I think it's a great question to ask. And thankfully, of course, when they go ashore, they find it's April Fool's Day, and the Japanese are going to give them a month of wandering around before the 1st Marine Division gets engaged. So are there any other questions? I think we have one right over here to the right. What was your feeling when you saw the flag being raised? Do you remember? Mr. Matheny, when you saw the flag being raised on Iwo Jima? Listen, it, uh, it was like we won. But, uh, you know, I knew that we had won, but it was a very inspiring thing uh, to see that flag up there. Of course, we fought 28 more days after that, but uh, I, I think that the 28th Marines, uh, uh, they did one hell of a job to get up that mountain and put the flag up. It was still all kind of japped on that and caves and everything else. And the truth of the matter is, we didn't realize that they had that underground cave network when we landed there. But it, it was a, a very exhilarating thing. Mr. Perrette? May I respond to that? Um, when the first flag was raised, the pole was too small and the flag was too small. And when Mr. Rosenthal came along wishing to do this famous scene, etc., uh, he requested a larger pole and a larger flag. And one of the Marines went down to the water's edge and just happened by chance uh, to come up to, on foot, to one of the Coast Guard manned LSTs and he requested a larger flag and a larger pole. And a Mr. Bob Resnick, a quartermaster aboard that LST, was the gentleman who passed the pole and the flag on to him. And a little known fact, you probably never heard this before, but anyway, that was what was raised on a second for that momentous occasion. And uh, I was called to Washington a few years ago, a couple of years ago, and was on a panel with Mr. Bob Resnick and, uh, and he was so proud to have been a part of this, et cetera, et cetera. And it was to be aired on like a Wednesday night, and he died on a Sunday morning, the before. He never saw the program. Bob Resnick, Coast Guard, quartermaster. I think we have, yes, sir. I like to, I didn't ever see a flag raised. Uh, a, the only flag I've ever seen raised was at Taliseo, when we made a landing at Taliseo on the New Britain Island on the New Monday Patrol. The first afternoon we landed, we raised the flag, and that kind of choked me up, and I thought to myself, God, I'm glad I'm an American. That sounds like a perfect way to conclude this. Let's thank these fine Americans. Thank you very much for coming. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being here so early today. And by being here early today, you've shown incredible wisdom because this session is definitely one not to be missed. The Second World War was a war uh, during which air power came into its own. Developed in the skies above the Western Front during World War I, air power in World War II was faster and deadlier. Indeed, the Second World War became a conflict that was dominated 
by what was done in the skies above the battlefield. Both in combat and in overall production, records were set during World War II that remain remarkable to this very day, which is why we're here to study the subject. In production, one record that remains um, amazing is the greatest aircraft manufacturing industrial production in human history, which was the manufacturing of the B-24 bomber. Over 16,000 of these were produced during World War II, and it's the most produced aircraft in human history, um, something that was, that was only made possible by American industrial production. But then in combat, for bombers, for fighter pilots, for troop carrier pilots, World War II was a conflict of incredible intensity and, in some cases, terrible brutality. Seated on this stage today are five of the most senior aviators you will ever see in one place. Five individuals who flew during the Second World War and distinguished themselves um, on three sides. I'm going to introduce them all very briefly for you now. Seated close to me, Colonel Richard Candelaria, United States Air Force. Next to him is Joachim Heine, who flew in the Luftwaffe during World War II. Next to Mr. Heine is Lieutenant Colonel Henry Bourgeois, who had the distinction of flying in a little uh, squadron called VMF-214, the Black Sheep Squadron, United States Marine Corps. <laughs> Next to Mr. Bourgeois is Colonel Charles McGee, United States Air Force. And then at the end of the table, Zinjiabe, who flew for the Japanese Imperial Navy, flying off the aircraft carriers Akagi, and then later Junyo. Good morning, Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jenny Abe. I'm very much pleased and also honored with this opportunity. <coughs> I speak about the air attack uh, power. <coughs> Abe-san was the pilot of a Japanese D-3A-1 Aiki dive bomber, what Americans called the VAL, um, and he flew during the second wave of the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, but he flew in other battles in the Pacific War as well. We'll hear more about that in a second. At this stage, though, I'm going to ask each of our five panelists to share a little bit about their experiences as a pilot, as an aviator in World War II, and we're going to begin on this end of the table and uh, Mr. Candelaria, or I should say Colonel Candelaria, excuse me, in approximately five minutes or so, could you please tell us a little bit about what you experienced in the air during World War II? You can do it right there from your seat. Oh, very well. Uh, my squadron and my group were stationed in England, in RAF Watersham, England, and our first uh, mission was flown on the 6th, uh, excuse me, it was the 7th of May of 1944, just before D-Day. At that time, we had P-38 uh, Lockheed Lightnings. So they were twin-engine fighters. Uh, later on that year, we converted to the P-51 Mustang, in which we got most of our victories. Our squadron did extremely well. Uh, we destroyed uh, over 47 uh, aircraft in less than... Uh, six months, and uh, I don't know anything about the Pacific area, but I can tell you that in the uh, European area, the 8th Air Force uh, did a lot of damage, and uh, some people may say that the air power can't win a war, 
but I can tell you that we can sure make it tough for the enemy to continue to fight. And uh, I think that some will agree that, no, we can't take any ground because we're flying above it. But we can sure help the ground troops get to their objective. Uh, I was very fortunate to become an ace. I was the only ace of my squadron, but others uh, shot down almost five, but uh, you have to have five or more in order to become an ace. And I was fortunate enough, my uh, first two kills were Focke-Wolf 190s, and uh, there were approximately 82, so many of them got away. The next time uh, I had a combat uh, where I could actually shoot, because at the very beginning, uh, you fly wing, that is the leader does the shooting, you just watch his uh, tail and make sure nobody gets there and uh, shoots him down. And I was fortunate enough to wind up in a position where I was able to save my leader. However, on one mission I was alone because of uh, bad weather and a small maintenance problem. I took off last, but I did get to the rendezvous point with the bombers first. And we were escorting at that time to Berlin that particular day. When I got to the bomber box that we were supposed to escort, I was still alone, and uh, I saw two ME 262s. These are Mr. Schmidt uh, twin engine jet fighters. And of course, you know, they could uh, leave us behind. However, I was above them, so I was able to intercept them, disperse them, and I did. Uh, I th believe that I shot one of them down, but I couldn't prove it because he went into the clouds trailing smoke and fire, but he could have pulled out, so I couldn't claim him as a confirmed kill. However, uh, about that time, about 15 to 16 ME-109s, these were single-engine fighter Messerschmitts, uh, attacked the formation. I was lucky enough to be there and have altitude on them and I engaged the leader who gave me a terrible time. He could make that Mr. Schmidt sing, re uh, recite poetry, dance, and play a violin while he was flying it. And for a while, I was sure he was going to get me, but I got lucky, and I hit him, and uh, he started going down, and with the others trailing behind us, they couldn't really get at me because I was so close to him at all times that uh, if they tried to shoot at me, they'd hit him, although I did see some... 20 millimeter shells that came out of that uh, uh, nose. He could probably tell you more about it than I can. But it's scary because it looks like a glowing golf ball. At any rate, uh, I was able to shoot down uh, three more, so that gave me four kills and one probable for that day. And of course, with the other kills that I had, it made me an ace. And uh, about that time, I was joined by uh, some of the squadron, and they came down and they saw the latter part of the action because they saw uh, explosions and flames, and they were able to, to pick me out. They were trying to find me because I kept telling them they ought to come and join the fun. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I, I really didn't mean it that way. But anyway, I was sure I was doing about five quick flaps around the beads all the time. So. At any rate, they came and they were able to confirm because they saw the crashed aircraft that were burning on the ground and uh, obviously they were killed. So I did get a confirmation. Uh, we went on to the target and at the target, uh, I turned around and uh, headed back home with uh, some of my flight with me. Since I had dropped my, drop, my external tanks, I jettisoned in order to tangle with the jets. Uh, I had less fuel than most of the others. However, that was a big day for us. Uh, another ME-262 was shot down by our squadron, and uh, uh, Captain Hooker uh, shot one down, and there were several 109s, and I believe one more, fought both 190 as well, but I can't remember all of the claims that were made by the group. At any rate, uh, our main uh, mission was the escort of the heavy bombers to get them to go to their target and home. And we had the range to go with them wherever they went. We went to Czechoslovakia, we went to the edge of the Russian border. We, wherever the bombers went, we went with them. And uh, I have a great deal of respect for all bomber pilots 
because if you could have seen them coming home, uh, two engines missing, half a tail gone, or pieces of wing, and, and they were just chapaka, chapaka, chapaka going home. <laughs> and we would pick up the, uh, the strays and try to herd them together to give them escort because the escort mission would have to go with the main force. You had to protect the, the largest number of bombers, so the strays were left behind to fend for themselves. And the Fox Wolf one-nighters would be climbing up, waiting for us to leave so that they'd go down and pick off the strays. So sometimes we would go back and, uh, and pick up the strays and herd them home. So that's how I gained a great deal of respect and admiration for any bomber crew that was out there in the European theater. I know nothing about the Pacific. Uh, just a bit of trivia, the very first ace was a Navy ace, darn it. Uh, uh, his name was uh, Donald Lopez and he was in the Navy. He shot down, he became the first ace of World War II and uh, Oscar Perdomo, uh, shot down the last, he became the last ace of World War II. He was in a P-47, he was U.S. Air Force, or U.S. Army Air Forces. Uh, he was based at Okinawa. At any rate, uh, the first and the last, uh, Lopez and Perdomo, and a whole bunch in between. Uh, it's, I'm quite proud of being an ace for this reason. Uh, you know, if you shoot them on down, why, uh, you paid for your training. If you shoot down two, it's, you pay for all the ones you pranked uh, on the runway or in taxing or something. And the third one, well, uh, now you've paid for your keep. The fourth one, luck. The fifth one, definitely lots of luck. So uh, if you're lucky enough to be an ace, you can say, uh, I can thank the good Lord that he made me an ace. By the way, of all of the aces that were shot down in Europe, again, I know nothing about the Pacific, that were shot down in Europe, only one was shot down by an enemy aircraft. It was a Fock Wolf 190. All the rest were shot down by anti-aircraft fire, or flak as we called it. I was shot down by flak, so I know what it's like. But uh, his name is Chuck Yeager, and you probably have all heard of him. He was the only ace shot down by an enemy aircraft. All the rest were shot down by anti-aircraft fire, friendly, unfriendly, well, all fire. There's no such thing as, un, as friendly fire. It's all unfriendly <laughs> if it hits you. Thank you. Okay, two comments. First of all, I think he deserves a round of applause for telling about all those dogfights without doing any of this, <laughs> which is normally what you see pilots doing, so that's, that's definitely something to reward you for. Uh, but then, uh, Colonel Candelaria, one quick question. What did you like better, P-38 or P-51 Mustang? Uh, my first love was a P-38. That's all I ever wanted to fly. But my last and, and the big love was a P-51 Mustang. You could outfight anything excuse me, <laughs> we could outfly <laughs> anything and everything that flew, if, if you played it right, if you did the right things. Okay, great, well thank you very much. Mr. Heine, um, if you wouldn't mind, sir, could you please in just a few minutes share a, a little bit about your experiences in flying for the Luftwaffe during World War II? Yeah, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> My name is Joachim Mahoney. I was born and raised in a strict military family because my dad used to be a fighter pilot in World War I with Richthofen, Berke, and Böhme. And uh, even Hermann Göring, I had to meet and shake hands with him as a little boy, which I didn't like him in the first, ta first time I met him. <laughs> well, I grew up on an air base in a close to a medieval town where you got your Grimm's fairy tales from Snow White and uh, Hansel and Gretel, and uh, all, all this. Uh, anyway, there on that base there, I was the only son of the commander, and naturally I had a free roaming. I flew with all kinds of airplanes, with uh, Yonkers 52, Heinkel 111. Uh, most of the bombers there 
they always gave me a ride because I, maybe they were getting a, a day off them from my father, you know, they could go home on vacation a little bit. So mm-hmm. They did a little brown nosing. Then as uh, things got bad, we, uh, young ones, uh, we were about 15, I was 15 years old. We had to uh, join the service as flag helper. Now, a flag helper, a flag really what means in a German, they, they love to make those mile long words. <laughs> uh, actually, that a uh, flag is a Flugabwehrkanone. Now, that, that's, that's even too much for a German soldier or a German, so they call it a flag. Now, if I, anybody gives you a flag, you know he is not doing, uh, liking you or is doing well for you, you know, so he wants to shoot on you. So I spent about a year as a flag helper and then I um, volunteered as a glider pilot in the 16. I flew my first gliders, and, but we were training on a fast landing, dead stick landings. And the dead stick landing, once you were down on the ground, that's it. You better find, find a place to stop or lay it on the wing and go around like a little, uh, or in circles uh, with that airplane. What really happened was, and after we uh, made all several uh, 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 rings, I uh, proudly uh, fastened to my little uniform, blue uniform, uh, and uh, I was commanded over to Sprottau, which was on the uh, east side of Germany, and that started to train on a 163 uh, rocket plane. Now, that was the first time these planes came in action, and you had no brakes. In fact, when you took off, you had to drop your wheels, and you had to land on a skid, and that's where all the glider training came in. And uh, believe me, the first time I was going there by myself, I had more butterflies than elephants in that thing. You, You sit there between two fuel tanks, if your rocket engine quits on the way up, it blow up on you. So you couldn't get out with the parachute. It went fine. I dropped my wheels, came down for a landing, put my skid out. And again, if you don't put the skid out, it'll bust your back. Well, I put the skid out and then I did a good landing and uh, got a little pat on the back. Till the, the couple of days later, I was supposed to go for another uh, flight. Well, uh, these, uh, t- uh, uh, our instructors, they like to party once in a while, and they partied that night before. And so the crew didn't know that. They filled up the first plane that goes up in the morning has full tanks. And since uh, the, the instructor, he didn't want to fly. They had a hangover. So I had to climb in that thing, and I fired up that engine back there, and it jerks you back, and then I dropped my gear, and then you pull the stick back, and you climb straight, straight, straight up, till your engine quits. Well, mine didn't quit. <laughs> I didn't know, I thought I had half tank full. I had full tanks. So I was up there, and I had, I had no guns on this thing. That was the trainer, 163, and they call it the Stummelhavich on top of that. And I was getting out of oxygen. I'm running out of oxygen. Altitude, I had plenty, so I just set that thing back on the nose and came down with high speed. That airplane was already built for breaking the the sound barrier. In fact, some of them did, and they lost their tail back there, but then they had to get out. (laughs) I came in for a landing, and I was sweating. It was, regardless, it was cold, but I was sweating. I was, I came, as I said it in for, for, on the grass. Now, for, for all things, the grass was wet. Now, you had no brakes on that thing. So, I knew on the end of the, the, our grass runway, there was a deep ditch. So, all I did, I just go ahead and, and ground looped it. So, I didn't want to hit the ditch. So, if I would have hit the ditch, it would explode, that thing. Mm-hmm. So, uh, well, I got, they got me out of it, and they wanted to find out if uh, I was still alive and how well I came through that mess. And that was the end of my flying uh, 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 as a fighter pilot. 
because meanwhile the Russians were knocking on the door. We were on the east front with our ME-163s, and of course we were picking up, like he said, the stragglers on the way to Russia or Romania. We were supposed to get those bombers there. Well, it didn't come to all that anymore. The Russians took over, and uh, I had to run up to uh, Peenemünde with our uh, battalion, and we had to hold the Russians back there so that Werner von Braun and all the rocket uh, uh, stuff and all his mechanics and uh, parts can go uh, uh, west to Denmark. We had to hold the Russians in, in a winter of 45 and snow and ice and with some sorry uh, uh, old French uh, guns we had them finally. And I got out of that too. And I still believe in guardian angels because in the last train out, I was arrested close about 20 miles north of Dresden and by the German MP because some of my papers were mixed up. So they put me in the clink. So I didn't mind. I finally had a good place to sleep. We got a meal. <laughs> but that night, it was that uh, 13th of February, that night they bombed Dresden. And so that's why I knew I had guardian angels because that train would have probably stopped right downtown Dresden and I wouldn't be here. So anyway, uh, I came out of that one. And then they called us Air Force Infantry. And we get over to the Autobahn in South Germany. And we were trying to stop uh, P Patton and his tanks and everything. It didn't work out too well, neither. <laughs> so <laughs> I ended up as a prisoner of war, all in one piece. And I thank the Lord for this to still today. And after my, my time in a, in, a, in a war camp, which I used my English, what I uh, had to learn in high school. See, in our high school, you had to have two foreign languages. I, ha I took uh, Latin and English. And we were reading already, when we were about 11 or 12 years old, we were reading Robert Kipling, The Jungle Book, in English. And I read, uh, I, well, you know, in those days, there was no television. The radio was full of propaganda and Wagner music, which... <laughs> I still don't like Wagner today. I'm more for Mozart. <laughs> really, <laughs> I can't stand him. <laughs> because I, after the war, I started a little bit music. Anyway, uh, when I came home, I was completely, uh, how should I say, um, uh, I was devastated. I mean, there was no future for me and, and nothing. I couldn't see. Germany was all b uh, bombed and, and destroyed. And I met an uh, engineer in a camp, and we uh, used the same tent. And he told me, why in the world don't you become an engineer? Get, look, here's an opportunity for you. So, but before you can become an engineer in Germany, you have to, excuse me, you have to go to learn a trade, either as bricklayer, concrete finisher, <coughs> or oh, carpenter, excuse me again. And so that takes three years. And, but in wintertime, I used to go to engineering school, and I finally got my engineer. Meanwhile, my, my mother uh, divorced, or my father divorced my mother. I don't know. I didn't get in a mess <laughs> there. And she went to Houston because one of my uncles, he was a, a professor in Germany, but we are, that was a, our southern part of our family, we were all Catholics, and he wrote some bad papers about Hitler. So he had to leave in a hurry and ended up in Houston. <coughs> Excuse me. My mother came then to Houston, and I didn't want to go, and I didn't want to go to, I didn't want to go to the United States, and I had nothing to do over here. What in the heck I want to go over there for? Well, she begging me and begging me, and so I said, well, okay. I finally got my papers, and it uh, wasn't that easy because a uh, consul, an American consul, he looked at my war record, and I was a Nazi leader there, a uh, Hitler Youth leader, because I was the bigger one and I knew how to box and beat him up better, you know. <laughs> so. Anyway, I, I got here to the States, and the second day I had to go to work already as an engineer in, in Galveston for the. For the a big company out of Houston, Farnsworth and Chambers. 
And believe me, when you're a little European, uh, how should I say, uh, civilian there or working over there, Europe, uh, uh, Germany is a little bit different. It's a little bit better organized. It's a little more uh, a law is enforced. And, and when I came here and had the crew out there in Galveston, uh, were half black and, and half Mexican and, and some other rowdies in there, it wasn't easy for me to, to make them listen to me and do what I want them to do. But it took, took about only four weeks and we were, all became friends. And then I also had on the other side uh, some ex-American soldiers who was fighting in Germany and they resented me too. Well, we all got in Galveston in a bar one Saturday night and got drunk. And, uh, and uh, from then on we were all one big old family and we finished it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for sharing that with us. It's not every day that you get to hear from a German rocket plane pilot. Um, so that's an interesting thing to sit and listen to. Um, it, it continues to fascinate me as a student of history to this very day to study the way that uh, German engineers and scientists perfected aviation in the years leading up to the Second World War and then during the war. Of course, they reached so many incredible milestones with their production of piston-driven aircraft, particularly fighters in the Focke-Wulf 190, the ME-109 Messerschmitt. Um, absolutely incredible aircraft. And then the fact that before the war ended, they were capable of deploying the ME-262 jet fighter and, of course, um, the Messerschmitt 163 rocket fighter. Um, it certainly demonstrates how uh, the Germans reached their own aviation milestones in World War II. Well, shifting now from the European theater of the war uh, around to the other side of the globe, let's hear from Lieutenant Colonel Henry Bourgeois, U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, Mr. Bourgeois, could you please tell us a little bit about what it was like to fly in the famous VMF-214 Black Sheep Squadron with Gregory Boeington? Yes, yeah, go on. I was born and raised in New Orleans and went to St. Aloysius High School and then to LSU. Best thing that happened to me was the war started because I was failing at LSU and I'm sure they're <laughs> going to kick me out. But I got my first flight in an airplane when I was seven years old. <clears throat> my father, Louis I. Bourgeois, and the Young Men Business Club arranged for air mail to come to New Orleans from Houston. And when the first flight arrived at Calendar Airfield south of New Orleans, we all went down to see the airplane. And the pilot took the men up every once in a while for a short ride, and there was always a little room in that cockpit for a little seven-year-old boy. And I, I <laughs> fell in love with airplanes. Uh, after going through flight school at um, NAS Corpus Christi and um, being de designated second lieutenant in the Marine Corps and, and to fight a school in San Diego, we were, uh, were sent overseas uh, as replacement pilots. And uh, Major Greg Pappy Boynton was a senior officer of the 13 pilots that were sent over there. And I remember meeting him and liking him immediately because he liked to tip a few as I did too at that time. And he was taking a, I'll never forget, he was taking a case of scotch to some friend over in the islands there. And about two days out of San Diego, we tipped the first bottle. And then it was pretty well gone by the time we got over there. But he and I got along because I like to play bridge and he liked to play bridge. And we had many sessions when there was nothing else to do. And this was in, we arrived in, in the, the, the um, Pacific Theater in January 1943, and you went into a fighter pool as a replacement pilot. And uh, he and I were assigned to uh, VMF-122. He was an executive officer, and I was a brand new young pilot that didn't know anything. And uh, I didn't really get to fly any missions there except two. We had uh, fl we were flying. F-4F Wildcats, and we had two airplanes that were photo reconnaissance models, and uh, they let me fly this, uh, doing some photographs over Munda where the, on uh, New Georgia Island, where the Marines were gonna land in a, in a few weeks. And uh, 
to fly this mission, you, you, you flew it about 2,000 feet and, and it held a, a certain speed. You couldn't maneuver anything and you just got shot at from the ground. Came back with lots of holes in the airplane. Uh, eventually, Boynton had, broke his leg in a, in a, a brawl fight and um, was sent to New Zealand to recover. And when he came back from uh, New Zealand, uh, they were looking for a squadron commander to take over VMF 214. And uh, he was designated that commanding officer. And he picked 28 pilots out of the pool. And eight of us were combat veterans, and the rest were brand new. And we were issued, uh, well, we'd been flying Corsairs. And they, in, in those, those days, you didn't get a personal Corsair. You, happened to f you flew whatever Corsair was available when you were assigned to a mission. And we w flew out of Guadalcanal at first and then moved up to Munda uh, Air Base on the New Georgia Island, which was close to the Japanese base in, it, it, uh, in Bougainville. Uh, I remember uh, one, one mission uh, that we were escorting Marine SBD dive bombers. There were 18 of them. And uh, we put 16 Corsairs in the air to, to, for air support. Uh, I was flying in one division in close air support. The bombers were about 7,000 feet. Uh, the uh, <coughs> low cover was just, just off to the one side of the other. And uh, <coughs> the other 16 Corsair, uh, 18, you know, eight Corsairs were flying at about 1,000 feet above us. As we approach, the, the target was the shipping in the uh, base there on Bougainville. And as we approach there, you could see this huge thunderstorm right over the, the, the base. And the mission commander decided that he couldn't attack there and decided to attack the airfield. And uh, the bombers, when they started the pushover, were right on the edge of the, the uh, thunderstorm. And about that same time, <clears throat> out of pick any number of uh, Japanese Zero airplanes you want to attack us. And we took them on. And uh, we tried to go down with the dive bombers to, to protect them, but eventually it ended up uh, being shot at. And, and I saw traces going by my wing and, and pulled into this, this, the clouds there and climbed back up a little bit and I came out, looked around, and there was a, a zero right in front of me. And I blasted him down and went back in the clouds because somebody else was shooting at me, did this a second time, and came out and shot another zero down. Went back in the clouds, and when I came out the third time, and, and dogfights quickly <coughs> spread all over the area, and there was nobody around. I couldn't see another single airplane. So I decided I'd, you know, I'm going to fly back to my base at Munda. And I'm going along kind of slow, not slow, but not paying attention too much. And all of a sudden, traces are coming over my wing. And I look back, and there was a, a zero sneaking up on me in the back. Uh, and I, I went to full power, close all the, the cowling flaps and the oil flaps to get as much speed as possible. And uh, Corsair, if you dove, uh, you could supposedly outrun the Zero. Well, I couldn't outrun this. I, I just didn't have the, the proper power. And I finally realized he was getting closer and I was shooting more and shooting more and that I was going to have to turn and fight him. And I was about ready to turn and try and do something, otherwise I'd be shot down. And he pulled up and left. Uh, and that really surprised me. Yeah, so I finally got to the base, no problem at all. Uh, after the war, I, I mean, after I retired from the Marine Corps, I went to work for an aerospace division of the Singer Company. And they had a subsidiary in, in Japan called Mitsubishi Precision. And my boss sent me over there to help them in planning how to, to market the gyros and navigation systems that my division built. The vice president of marketing in this company over there was a retired Japanese pilot by the name of uh, Suo Moda. 
And he and I became very friendly because uh, we had things in common, like he liked to hunt, I liked to hunt. And in Japan at that time, very, very few people had the privilege of, you know, hunting birds and ducks and things. We got to talking uh, about what we'd done in the past, and we talked about, you know, World War II and the Allies. You know, I told him I'd been in the Solomons, and he said, well, I've, I was in the Solomons. I was commanding this squadron on, on Bougainville. And I said, well, you know, I'm relating my experiences. He says, you know, I, I think we better check our log books. So he came to, New, uh, to the United States a couple of weeks later, and he brought his log book, and I got my log book out, and sure enough, this was the guy trying to shoot me down. <laughs> and uh, so we got along. He brought me a custom-made shotgun, which is a, was a beauty. And so I, I, I took him hunting on the eastern shore of Maryland, and we had one of those days where the birds came in low and slow, and. He got his limit in the morning, we got another limit in the afternoon, and we went back to the hotel to, to have a final dinner together. And after dinner there, we're you know, sipping some wine and stuff, and he, he sits up and he says, Henry, I'm sure glad to hell I didn't shoot you down. <laughs> <laughs> there were many successful squadrons in the Pacific, you know, Air Force, Navy, and Marines. But one of the famous was VMF 214 Black Sheep. Pappy Boynton, I'm sure you've heard a lot about, was a commanding officer. Uh, and we had some great fights in air to air. And uh, the squadron in there two, I think it was about six weeks, uh, shot down about 96 uh, Japanese airplanes. Boynton shot down 22 of them, and he probably he had six before in the Flying Tigers, so he was the, the leading Marine ace in World War II with 28 kills. Uh, he was shot down in January uh, and uh, picked up by a Japanese submarine, eventually went to Japan as a, as a prisoner of war, and uh, he was released after the war. Uh, and came back to the state. I'll never forget uh, when we were having the first squadron meetings when the squadron was organized, and, and we were talking about all kinds of things. And he, he said, if I'm ever missing, he says, don't worry about me. He says, because after the war, I'll meet you in a bar in San Diego, and we'll celebrate. And sure enough, after the war, when they released him, they flew to San, San Francisco. And uh, Chance Vaught, who built the Corsairs that we flew, sponsored a three-day drunken dinner, and Boynton was there. And I still have a hangover from that dinner there. Uh, in, in, in VMF 122, uh, we had a lot of successes. And uh, there was one interesting thing I'd like to tell you about. Uh, we were scrambled to intercept Japanese bombers coming down to, to um, sink the Marine landing on Munda in the shipping. And the weather was one of these terrible days like we have in New Orleans with rain and thunderstorms. And, and uh, we took off. I was flying uh, the second section of a four-plane division. And we were about halfway there, and my, my wingman radio that he's having hen engine problems and he had to turn back and go back to Guadalcanal. And he turned and I lost him in the clouds. And I, I let down as below the clouds, which was about 400 feet, four or 500 feet. And I never could see him again. And uh, we never know what happened to him. Uh, and then I, I was kind of lost, not sure what to do decided maybe I'd better go back to Guadalcanal. And I headed in a direction I thought was Guadalcanal. Uh, and I'm flying alone, and, and if I saw some marine dive bombers in a flight of nine over on one side. And I said, hey, these guys have got to know where they're going. I'll join up on them. And so I did, and we flew along and flew along and flew along. And finally, they split, and the leader and the first four SBDs went to the right, and the others went to the left. And I said, well, I better stick with the leader. He sure knows what he's doing. 
Well, he, he was, didn't really. And we flew and flew and flew, and we ended up on an island called Rennell. It was about 100 miles south of uh, Guadalcanal. And we had strip maps of the Solomon Islands, but the, uh, Rennell was not on it. I had no idea where I was, and my radio didn't work. And we circled the uh, Rennell, which had a lagoon in the middle for a while, and pretty soon the uh, SVD pilots went down and, and landed in the lagoon in the water. And I said, well, I guess I got to do the same thing. Now, you got to remember, I'm 21. I'm scared as hell. I don't know what I'm doing. But I made a water landing. And this Corsair was supposed to float for a little bit, but it went straight down to the bottom. And uh, I got out of there. I stood on my life raft, and it went down with the airplane. Now, I went here, imagine now you're dressed with, you're carrying a side arm, you've got a, a belt around you with a water can, and a, a, you know, medical stuff and other things. You've got heavy boots on and stuff. And I'm floundering a lot around in this water in the lagoon and wondering if there are sharks in there or what. And pretty soon a native boat came out and, and picked me up. And they took me ashore. And it was now late in the afternoon. It was rainy, misty, cold, and nasty. And they put me in a little lean-to. I couldn't communicate with these people. Uh, they, you know, they had their own language. But they brought me a little bowl of rice, and uh, I slept the night as best I could in the morning. They had lashed two canoes together with a platform on it, and four big uh, natives there said, you know, come on, let's get aboard. And we paddled down someplace and ended up at the, the, the main island uh, village, which was at the end of the uh, lagoon. Uh, and there, the, the chief could speak some pretty good English because the, the English minister had been in the islands there. Um, and they treated me. I was the first one to arrive. Uh, and the, the chief says, uh, you know, are you number one? Well, I didn't know what he meant. I said, yeah, I'm number one. <laughs> so I got to sleep in, in, in his hut, which was really a, a, a house that night. On, on, uh, and, you know, his, his daughter was right next to me, so it was kind of nice. <laughs> uh, the next morning, the, uh, the other pilots and crew started to arrive. And, but before they did, uh, two or three big I mean, big natives came and took me by the arms and dragged me down to the shore. And, and uh, I didn't know what they wanted, but I went with them anyway. And they put me in a little canoe, and we paddled out to an island in the lagoon with all these palmetto trees and, and coconut trees. And we went through the bushes and came to a lean-to. And uh, there was a, a woman laying there. and. Uh, and she had an attendant, another woman, and uh, they pointed at her and they pointed at me, like, you know, do something. I didn't know what to do. And uh, so I knelt down, and obviously she was pregnant. And uh, I put my hand on her belly and on her head, like I knew what I was doing. And, and I had some aspirin in my uh, first aid kit, so I gave the aspirin to the attendant. And I said, you know, give her one, and I what, whatever I could get through to him. It wasn't. So everybody was happy, and we went back to the, uh, the chief's village, and that day they, they caught a big fish in, in the ocean and brought it in, and they baked it, and they, you know, we had a good time. The next morning, the, the Navy and the Marines finally figured out where all these dumb pilots were, and they sent a PBY down to look for us, and, and they, we signaled the airplane. It landed in the lagoon to pick us up, and aboard the uh, uh, airplane was a Navy corpsman, and I, I told him about this lady out there who's pregnant, and maybe you know they ought to do something about it. So he went out and looked, and he came back and said, "Yeah, she is really pregnant, and way overdue." Oh, uh, the next day, well, they, they took us off and flew back to Guadalcanal. The next day, the uh, the Navy flew some doctors down, and uh, they took the baby, made sure it got born, it was healthy, and all that. Then. And um, when they came back, <clears throat> they brought, the chief had sent some ceremonial sticks along that were all carved uh, with American Marines and all that stuff. And, uh, and they, they told me that the, the chief was really happy that I'd done something for his wife. 
and that they had named the boy Boo-Ja-Wa. <laughs> <laughs> Ever, ever since then, I've been known as Doc Boo. <laughs> well, thank you for that account, Doc Boo. Um, <laughs> one quick question before we move on. What'd you like better, the F4U Corsair or the F4F Wildcat? Oh, the, the Corsair, I'll tell you, I, I can remember the first time I flew the Corsair. Uh, I'd never seen the airplane before, but you sit in it, and it's got this great big 2800 R, uh, R engine with about 2,000 horsepower. And, and uh, you push a throttle forward, and it's just like being accelerated on a rocket. It was fast, it was strong, it had six 50 caliber machine guns <laughs> that were all aligned to, to hit at about uh, 150 yards in front of the airplane. And if you hit a Japanese airplane, it just tore it all apart because they had incendiary rounds, they had uh, armor-piercing and explosive rounds. And uh, you know, you know, as long as you could you know, bore sight on a, on a Japanese airplane, which were very fragile, they had no self-sealing tanks or armor plate. Uh, you, you just absolutely destroyed them. The, uh, and also, uh, the, 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 the Black Sheep Squadron did a lot of missions on the ground, strafing, Air, airfields, uh, landing boats, shipping, and all that stuff. And, and if you get uh, two or three Corsairs in a line coming in one behind the other, you could destroy anything, which is a super airplane. I flew them for most of my first, well, up, up until the Korean War, and I have about 350 hours in the airplane. <clears throat> two years ago, I was at an air show in Indianapolis, and there was a uh, airline pilot who had restored a, a, a Corsair, just like the ones we flew. Uh, and he had put a jump seat behind the pilot uh, and took out the armor plate and whatever is back there. And he took me up for a ride. I'll tell you what a thrill that was to sit in that airplane and hear that engine rev up and zoom down the runway to take off. So I could fly it again today if they'd give me one. <laughs> Well, pivoting now from the, back from the Pacific War, it's often, I think, forgotten that the Marine Corps contributed fighter, bomber, patrol, and transport squadrons to the war, and they all did their part, uh, just as uh, VMF 214 did, Mr. Bourgeois did. Um, now, moving on to our next extremely experienced aviator, uh, Colonel Charles McGee, who flew not just in World War II, but maybe he'll tell us a little bit more about that. Colonel McGee? Good morning, all. Thank you. Uh, it's good to be here to talk to you about the black experience in aviation, uh, military aviation. Colonel Candelera spoke of the 8th Air Force activity, which was out of England. The black experience uh, would be out of 12th and 15th Air Force, uh, flying uh, from the southern part of uh, uh, Germany, but flying from France all the way over to the Romanian oil fields. Uh, the, I'll talk about segregation tomorrow, but today I will talk about the, what, what was accomplished, and we'd have to do that in two phases, because the first authorization by the Army Air Corps was for one pursuit squadron, which was the 99th pursuit squadron, and they would fly P-40 aircraft. Uh, they were trained, and the 99th went uh, uh, eventually to uh, uh, North Africa, uh, supporting uh, the push of the uh, German army out of uh, uh, Rommel out of uh, North Africa and then up to boot of, of uh, Italy, uh, moving into uh, Sicily and then in, in, into Italy. The 99th uh, uh, flew uh, four 12th Air Force uh, more than 2,500 sorties in, the, in their support work. Uh, as you know, during the war, Panelleria surrendered without any ground troops uh, uh, going to the island. Uh, then they moved into Sicily, 
and as the Germans were pushed out of Sicily into uh, southern Italy and then slowly up the uh, uh, boot of Italy uh, on to the, to the war, war, war's end. The, uh, contrary to some stories that uh, we always got hand-me-down aircraft, uh, the 99th got brand new P-40 when they uh, arrived in, the north, in, in north, north Africa. Well, the, behind the 99th, there were three more fighter squadrons, the 100, 301st, and 302nd that became the 332nd fighter group. Uh, we were trained in the uh, P-40, and then they said, your mission is going to change. You're going to do patrol work with the P-39 Bell Air Cobra. We did a little additional formation and gunnery, but still left the states uh, on schedule in uh, December of uh, 43, going directly to Italy, uh, flying harbor and coastal patrol. Now the 99th was attached to white groups and they were doing the interdiction work as the uh, 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 ground support uh, moved northward up the uh, peninsula of Italy. Uh, the 332nd group was doing the harbor and coastal patrol out of the Naples area. It was about the uh, April time frame, uh, as was mentioned, uh, uh, the bombers uh, destroying Germany's war making potential uh, were suffering extremely high losses as they were now flying out of uh, Italy uh, and so they were flying deeper into the German protected areas. And, and the losses in some cases over the targets was more than 50% of the bombers. So uh, 15th Air Force was formed to uh, provide fighter escort for our B-17s and B-24s. And of the four groups picked to begin that escort work, the 332nd Fighter Group was one of those groups picked. So in combat, we dropped the P-39s. In fact, we gave them to the Russians in their support ground support work, and uh, received the P-47 Thunderbolt and began moving from the Naples area of Italy to the uh, Adriatic side where we'd be closer to joining up with the bombers and closer to uh, the uh, target areas that uh, we would be covering. And uh, we uh, started that work with 15th Air Force to say with the P-47 Thunderbolt um, and uh, through the, uh, the period, we flew more than uh, uh, 1,500 sort of missions, rather, which uh, a mission is assigned to a squadron, but each squadron would put up uh, 16 aircraft. So there are uh, many sorties involved when we say one mission. So in those some 1,500 missions, uh, total uh, uh, fighting for 12th and 15th Air Force, there were more than 15,000 sorties. But in the, we only had the P-47 uh, doing that uh, strategic escort work for a couple of months and the, the famed P-51 Mustang became available and, and all of the uh, escort groups uh, received the P-51 Mustang, uh, which uh, is, if you ask an old fighter pilot, what do you like, I'd always say, well, the, 51 Mustang was, was great for the work that we were doing because it was a maneuverable aircraft from the ground to 35,000 feet and it had the speed and range that was above uh, the other aircraft available uh, at the time. Interesting in, in our experience, uh, when we got the P-51 in early July of 1944, uh, the powers to be decided to move the 99th from their tactical work to and assign them to the 332nd Fighter Group. So the 332nd had the largest f group fighter force for 15th Air Force from that July 44 on through the end of the war in 45. In fact, uh, one of the stories of the experience, oh, there are a couple, uh, when we had the P-47 uh, returning from a bomber mission uh, uh, returning to base, we often were given uh, 
free exercise to attack other targets if we had the fuel and so on, and the flight of the P-47s sank a destroyer-type vessel in Trieste Harbor uh, just with their machine gun fire. And fortunately, they had the gun film to prove that uh, it was done without bombs. Uh, but as was said, uh, well bore sighted with, that's the advantage of the P-47, it had eight guns and when you bore sight them well, you put a lot of lead in a small hole out there in front of you, and it, it, did, it, did, it did the job. Um, the other uh, experience, late in the war, I had come home and uh, became a twin engine pilot and program, but that's another story. Um, the, uh, they speak of the great train robbery. Well, it happened that uh, the mission called for a long range and it was going to be to Berlin. And uh, the operations officer spoke to his lineman and wondered how many aircraft have the large tanks on them. Normally uh, we carried a 75 gallon, I believe, a fuel tank, but there were also 110 gallon tanks available. And, and uh, the crewman said, we only have three aircraft uh, with large tanks and he said, well, we've got to find some more. So one of the maintenance officers with some crewmen and a six by truck uh, left the base in Remitelli and uh, toward the Foggia depot area. And uh, they found a train um, with tanks on it that was proceeding that would have been delivered uh, eventually uh, to, to the unit. Uh, but they stopped the train and uh, supposedly, or the story goes that, that uh, of course they had their side arms, I don't know, they didn't have to use them, but they got tanks off of the uh, train and trucked them back and with the crewmen working hard, dropping the uh, smaller tanks, uh, they had the aircraft available uh, and uh, refueled with the larger tanks by takeoff time uh, that morning and it's, happenstance sometimes how things happen or become come about. Uh, the 332nd had the penetration escort of the bombers to Berlin, but the group that was to relieve them uh, missed the uh, timing, and so the 332nd remained with the, uh, uh, the bombers on over Berlin. In fact, uh, they shot down three of those ME-262s that were shot down. Uh, that day, and again, you heard that uh, the advantage of doing that with the piston-driven uh, P-51 was altitude and speed, and of course, that was a new aircraft, and, and they uh, hadn't uh, developed uh, combat tactics to the point of taking advantage of their speed, and so uh, that, that took place. So altogether, uh, the uh, between the 12th and 15th Air Force uh, uh, missions, uh, as I say, there were over 1,500 missions and over 15,000 sorties flown uh, by the uh, 99th and the 332nd Fighter Group combined and uh, destroyed uh, over 100 aircraft, uh, damaged a great number, uh, uh, that was in the air. We also had occasional fighter sweeps uh, because we did uh, limit Germany's uh, war-making potential and, and many times they did not have the fuel to put aircraft in the air and we were able to uh, destroy more than 150 and damage many equal number um, on the ground in, in, in those fighter sweeps. But that uh, gives you uh, a capsule of, of the experience uh, of the four fighter squadrons that uh, came out of the so-called Tuskegee experience, but we'll talk more about that, that tomorrow. And if we may, uh, if you want to know what happened to me, I can ask them if they'll show that fort short clip of the elder statesman. We'll do that at the end, if that's okay. Certainly. Sure. Well, thank you. One of the reasons that I enjoy doing what I do for a living is that I get to meet exceptional people. People um, 
who frequently inspire me. Uh, the man that just spoke at no point uh, talked about himself very much. He talked in terms of we, in terms of the squadron and the group. And I certainly think that that's something that's worthy of admiration. But I would like, Colonel McGee, for you to answer this question, sir. Um, in 1947, the United States Air Force became its own separate branch of service, and you remained in the Air Force. How long did you remain in the Air Force, and how many wars did you fly in? Oh, uh, you don't volunteer, I guess. You're, you're, you're around. Uh, I remained in the service for uh, 30 years, and uh, happened to be around when the Korean War picked out, and being a P-51 pilot, they grabbed us up right quick because we didn't have our jets in place to support that United Nations effort. Uh, so I flew, well, I'd flown 136 missions in Europe and I flew 100 in Korea. And I'm still around a little bit later as we formed uh, a new tactical reconnaissance squadron. So I'm on board to uh, fly 172 missions in Vietnam. Excuse my candor, but that's a hell of a lot of combat flying right there. Was a lot of well, last but not least, um, we would now like to hear from Shinji Abe about his experiences as a Japanese naval uh, bomber pilot in World War II. Abe-san. About the air power, on December 9th, 1941, two days after Pearl Harbor attack, Imperial Japanese Navy sank two British battleships of Prince of Wales and the Repairs that England was proud of to be unsinkable battleships by air attacker. These two sea battles in Hawaii and the Marae proved the traditional big ship, big gunism. Wars begun and air power took place in the main halls. It was a surprise that Japan, a poor country, engaged in these two sea battles, and Japanese Navy of only 70 years career did. I I would like to remember this, several points how U.S. and the Japanese Navy respectively took a positive stand on this point seriously and made use of this fundamental philosophy in reforcing and or investing their armaments. One of them, America strove to construct aircraft carriers and produce aircraft making the best use of their excellent technical developments 
and huge industrial production ability. As a result, U.S. had only three aircraft carriers in 1941. But Admiral Harvey, whom we confronted in Mariana Sea Battle in, in June 1944, was leading a task force with 15 regular aircraft carriers carrying 930 aircraft in total. On the other hand, Ozawa fleet was leading nine aircraft carriers, including remodeled aircraft carriers from the merchant ship and uh, small old start aircraft carrier carrying 420 aircraft in total. In this connection, when we look at the type of aircraft, half of American aircraft were fighter planes for defense. On the other hand, two-thirds of Japanese aircraft were for offense. We can tell a slight difference between U.S. and the Japanese Navy's strategic thought on this point. Second point, if the immediate purpose of the Pearl Harbor attack was to gain time to secure natural resources in Southeast Asia, Japan did not have to let Nagumo Force stick there who was the first three months in the following year, 1942, as Japan had achieved its purpose efficiently by the previous attack. Japan ought to advance toward the east and attack Hornets, Enterprise, and Lexington. That Japan missed to think and prevent the recovery of U.S. Navy's air power as U.S. aircraft carriers were attacking Japanese naval bases scattered in the middle Pacific Ocean, including Marshall, one by one since January 1942. Third point, middle operation was not thoroughly studied beforehand. New aircraft carrier Shokak and Zuikak were damaged at the Coral Sea and the Solomon Sea Battle in May 1942, and they were not able to participate in midway operation. Moreover, Akagi Kaga, Soryu, 
and he knew, had been participated in operation in Southeast Asia and toward the Indian Ocean four months and three months from the beginning of the year. And it was the end of uh, April when these ships returned home. Naturally, they needed the repair and the supplies. Degrees of the trained crew members. But there was no enough time. Why Japanese Navy had to, to occupy Midway under these circumstances in hurry? I believe that. The military operation was driven by Admiral Yamamoto's devotion to the Emperor and his regret for having allowed Dorit raid on Tokyo, Nagoya, Osaka, and other main cities in Japan's mainland on April 18th. Could we remove our fear to be laid again our land if Japan had occupied the midway, Ats and Kisuka in addition? The answer is no. The Pacific Ocean is vast. Even if Japan could have occupied those places briefly, Japan had no ability to maintain the occupation so long. Anyhow, on May, 27, 1942, Nagumo Task Force with four aircraft carriers, Akagi, Kaga, Soryu, and Hiryu, as core, left Japan toward east, and some 300 miles behind Admiral Yamamoto on board Dreadnought Yamato, spearheading toward east with seven battleships and uh, escorting aircraft carriers as the main force. Cruising speed of Japanese warships was 12 knots at that time. I would like, uh, uh, it, it, it would take 12 hours and a half to reach where Nagumo Force was fighting in 300 miles ahead. Even they speeded up in double to 24 knots. Nagumo's enemy was 250 miles further. This fighting rate and advanced formation mean big ship, big gunism has hmm, not removed away and it was a piece of evidence that Japanese Navy was not concentrating and emphasizing the on air power. Lastly, 
Maybe you would say it's a silly thing, like counting the age of a dead baby. However, there is a saying, if you run after two hair, you will catch neither. I really cannot understand why a clever leader like Yamamoto Isoroku assigned Nagma for two missions, attack Midway Island and sink American aircraft carriers. Midway Island won't sink even some 10,000 of bombs were released. If we wanted to smash facilities and aircraft on land, we could have done it by firing guns or battleships. As there were more than 10 battleships, Japanese, sent for military operation. We might have had a quite a different result if Yamamoto had concentrated air power there and command Nagma Force only to attack American aircraft carriers. Imperial Japanese Navy was suffered a terrible defeat. <coughs> Midway operation in June 1942 as a turning point. Japanese Navy rapidly traveled down to defeat. As Yamamoto Isoroku reported to Prime Minister Konoe in February 1941. He tried his utmost to fight, but only for half a year. Thank you very much indeed for this meeting. Lumorgato on Abesan. It's an interesting turn of events that you can have so many years later, American pilots, a German pilot, and a Japanese pilot on the same stage. And uh, so I think we're all fortunate to have chosen to have been a part of this session today. Uh, we've gone over time. But you know what? To heck with it, because we had a good time, I think. And may I have one last round of applause for our panelists. Richard Candelaria, Joaquim Heine, Lieutenant Colonel Henry Bourgeois, Colonel Charles McGee, and Zinje Abe. Uh, I have greetings for all of you from Luxembourg, from my, my home country. Luxembourg, a teeny country in Western Europe, was liberated twice by American forces, and Luxembourg is also the final resting place of your and our national hero, General George Smith Panton, Jr., who's buried in Luxembourg. But I first also would like to salute all the veterans, 
all the men and the women of the uh, greatest generation that brought back liberty to my home country. Without their commitment and their answer to uh, the call of duty, I would not be here tonight. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so it's a great uh, honor and pleasure for me to uh, be uh, with all of you tonight gathered around this table as part of the National World War II Museum sponsored international conference on World War II and more specifically the Memory Hall experience where World War II participants, veterans and witnesses share their personal experience that marked them forever as a living history lesson and as a legacy for, uh, for the future generations. I am very privileged to participate in this roundtable discussion as a member of the post-World War II generation. Again, my name is Roland Gall. I'm a Luxembourg citizen, and um, but the country was again liberated in September 44 and subsequently thereafter during the Battle of the Bulge in December 44 and January 45. And personally, I am the founder and curator of the National Museum of Military History in Dikers, Luxembourg, where this chapter of history uh, is preserved in a balanced and lively way as a, remember, a re reminder of the past and as a prominent and lasting tribute to our American and allied liberators. At the same time, the museum is also a platform of reconciliation between nations that were facing each other more than 60 years ago. Uh, our museum, uh, which has a privileged relationship with the National World War II Museum for a few years, relies as a great deal on oral history accounts and on interviews made with American, Allied, and German veterans, as well as from local civilians, as they represent a precious wealth of very detailed and accurate information of personal striking stories and as a legacy of the human dimension of a bygone worldwide conflict for mankind of a past we all share. Remembrance is important as it nurtures people's and nations' awareness of a collective memory. So the National World War II Museum is aware of this fact and must be congratulated, congratulated by the international community for this outstanding initiative to sponsor and host this international conference in an effort to bring together key speakers and historians to reflect on the World War II experience. Along that line, I'm very honored to introduce you tonight the following distinguished participants of this roundtable, where we have with us, if you permit, ladies first, Mrs. Margaret Ringenberg, a former WASP or Women's Air Force Service Pilot, Mrs. Carmen Bozak, a former Women's Army Auxiliary Corps who encoded teletype messages for the battlefield. Then we have Mr. Walter Ehlers, Congressional Medal of Honor winner, who served amongst others units with the 1st U.S. Infantry Division, the Big Red One, in several theaters of operation, and Captain Joachim Wedekind, former German merchant mariner, who had to support Hitler's war effort. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us tonight. It's a true pleasure for me indeed to be here with you. Before we're discussing tonight's key topic, air, sea, and land, may I suggest everyone to briefly introduce her or himself with a narrative and a respective uh, a career with the armed forces as well as perhaps key missions and events. Thank you, and may I start then with Mrs. Ringenberg, please. Well, thank you. I'm Margaret Ringenberg, and I had the privilege of being a WASP, Women's Air Force Service Pilot, in World War II. Now, this museum is not only a place for future generations, but it's a place, it's a wonderful place for people like myself to come and see. I remember those good old days. During the buildup of the war, I was living with my uh, mom and dad and two sisters on a farm in northern Indiana. I was trying to decide uh, what I would do when I graduated from high school. Now, I could be a teacher, a nurse, uh, wait tables, or get married, but I was fascinated with airplanes. I decided I would be a stewardess because I knew that girls can't be pilots. I thought the word pilot meant boy or man. I also thought the word veteran meant a boy or man that had fought overseas, and I'm still struggling when they ask people in a group, to, uh, the veterans, to stand. I'm not sure that I'm supposed to stand. 
Then I thought, what if I happen if I what if something would happen to the pilot while I was serving as a stewardess? I better take a few flying lessons. And this is how it started. I started flying when I was 19 years old, and I loved it. I got my private license when I was 20. I could never have imagined the places that license would take me. Then when I was 21, I got an invitation to become a WASP, a telegram from the government saying my service was needed in the Women's Air Force Service Pilot. Now, we transported airplanes in the United States during World War II. Some of the girls ferried, uh, uh, did some other works like towing targets or uh, teaching or many other occupations. I had many exciting days testing and ferrying airplanes and delivering them to people in the United States as a military pilot. Then I got new orders. Wasps were no longer needed. I was to remove all insignia on December the 20th, 1944. I came home to Fort Wayne with a single and multi-engine commercial license and a real sense of sadness. I boxed up my uniform and wings and put them away in a, the attic. I didn't talk about the experience for several years because I was so offended. But I signed up for the reserve in case there was another war. Now, I worked at the airport and got my instructor's rating in March of 45, and I, am, I still have my instructor's rating and still flying. I started flying for Pierce Flying Service where I had learned to fly. But who wants to fly with a girl pilot? I had more time and experience than any other instructor, but I was a girl. It took time to be accepted, and I had to be patient. Eventually, my appointment book was full. In October of 46, I married Morris Ringenberg. He was from the same church I had gone to and had served in the Army Air Corps of Engineers and had the Purple Heart. We started our family, but I still managed to instruct and fly the Powderpuff Derby each year. Suddenly, I was 40. It seemed so old. Could I continue to fly? Brownies, Girl Scouting, and being a high school band mom soon filled my days. But I squeezed in flying the Potter Puff Derby in the Air Race Classic, plus doing some instructing in corporate flying. I then became the grandmother of five awesome grandchildren and became a school career day speaker. Before I knew it, I was 60. Now it's really getting trickier. It was hard to get insurance to be a chief pilot for a corporation because of my age. Life took a different twist. I ventured out internationally for the first time when I picked up an airplane in Australia in 1993 and brought it to the United States. Then in 94, I piloted it in a round the world air race with an all woman team. After that, I was featured in Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation, and wrote my own book, uh, Girls Can't Be Pilots. My speaking opportunities challenged me, too, as I was invited to address the cadets at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. Then, in March of 2001, I was privileged to be part of the Sky Tracker team in a London to Sydney air race. All 10 of my members were able to spend the weekend in London to see me off. Our team had many adventures, including an aircraft a controller saying, X-ray Papa Kilo, correct your track immediately or you'll be fired on. And it, now that was not us, it was another team. In this race, we flew 63 hours through 17 countries with 28 stops along the historic Kangaroo route. It was an amazing adventure. And I would like to add, although it's required that all aircraft controllers speak the universal aircraft language English, it's not necessarily that they're understandable. That same year, I flew the Air Race Classic with my grandson. So now all five of my grandchildren have trophies with their grandmother. 
In June of 2001, my daughter and I flew the Air Race Classic Coast to Coast Race and placed top 10. In 2002, I was invited to the Johnson Space Center where I spoke for the astronauts that led me to be placed on the astronaut's speaking list. While there, I got to fly the, air, uh, the shuttle simulator and work the retrieval arm, and the hardest thing was getting into the thing. Then in June of 2003, I flew the Air Race Classic in a close-to-coast race that ended up over Kitty Hawk. My co-pilot and I took second place. Then in April of 2004, I got to ride in an Indy car and go 180 mile an hour. That was not for me. You know, they had make a wish for children. They have now a make a wish for seniors. When is one supposed to slow down? I have pay, passed the big 8-5. Morris and I were married for over 56 years when I lost my biggest fan. I am now doing the grandmother thing. I still have the privilege of sharing my story with audiences several times a week. I do a lot of speaking at schools. Schools need our attention. I can hardly wait to see what the 20, next 20 years will bring. You see, World War II not only changed the world, it changed many of our lives. Thank you. May we now turn to Mrs. Carmen Bozak, please? I was born in Puerto Rico. I went to school in New York City, and I was working for the War Department in Washington, D.C. when war broke out in December of 1941. As soon as the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps was established in 1942, I decided to join not, not just to get away from a very boring job I had as a clerk typist in the payroll department of the, uh, of the uh, Corps of Engineers, but because there was such hype about patriotism that everyone wanted to get involved. That I did, and three months later, I was on a train to a very cold place, Des Moines, Iowa, for my basic training. Not long after that, in January of 1943, I was on a troop ship for parts unknown. Upon crossing the Straits of Gibraltar, it was evident that we were headed for the North African Theater of Operations. During the first three months in Algiers, I experienced four German air raids, the fourth being the worst, for it landed just a few blocks from General Eisenhower headquarters, where I worked with the Signal Corps as a teletype operator, we would send coded messages to the front, to Nisha and uh, to General Montgomery. And the war was still uh, very uh, active there in those days. Most of the uh, messages were in code, so we don't know what we were sending. But it was interesting, we, were, we would use British teletype machines 
that would receive and send messages at the same time. <clears throat> During the 17 months that I spent in Algiers, North Africa, I was billeted in a convent, in a museum, in an apartment building across the street from the St. George Hotel where General Eisenhower would meet all the WACs who were working at the St. George Hotel with a good morning, Corporal, good morning, Sergeant, whatever the case may be. After I left our gears, I went to work also as a type operator, teletype operator in Caserta, Italy. We were working in a castle and we were billeted in a Canadian hospital. By now, it was time to come home on rotation or on points. The timing was perfect, for in July 1945, I met the man who was destined to be my husband. Master Sergeant Ted Bozak had been seriously injured in Germany with the 30th Infantry Division, and he was a patient at Valley Forge General Hospital outside of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. I had contracted an infection in my left eye, and I also was a patient there. In 1961, the Bozaks, all five of us, re relocated in Florida. And in 1991, the old infantry sergeant passed away. I organized the WAC chapter in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 16 years ago. And uh, I also organized the Society of Military Widows. I belong to every service organization there is. My husband used to call me the flag waver. <laughs> and. Uh, I, uh, I've been doing volunteer work at the uh, Oakland Park Outpatient Clinic for 18 years, and I've been a member of the National WAC Vets Organization. Uh, I was a member of the National Honor Guard, and I just received my 25-year certificate, and I figure, well, it's time to retire because I have a bad knee and I cannot stand for long periods of time. I feel that I did my part, I contributed, I did the best I could, and here I am. Thank you. May we now turn to Mr. Walter uh, Ehlers, Congressional Medal of Honor winner. Good evening, folks. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay from here? Well, I'll stay here then. <laughs> uh, my brother and I uh, uh, knew all about what was happening over in Germany because we had been reading about it. And of course, I had grandparents who actually came from Germany and they told us that there was going to be another war with Germany. And so when uh, the United States starts getting excited about, you know, we didn't want to go into war. We were, uh, we were going to stay out of it. But uh, we could see that it wasn't going to happen that way because uh, the Germans were getting very much brave. They came out and they were even uh, sinking our shipping off of the coast of the United States of America and things like this before the war even started. And uh, so in uh, 1940, the government was getting excited. They decided, well, they better start a selective service system and start building up their military because they were going to be expecting a war very soon. And uh, my brother didn't want to be uh, drafted. He wanted to go and volunteer. So I said, well, I want to volunteer with you. So we both went down to the Fort Riley, Kansas, and. Uh, volunteered for military service and 
uh, they told me, they said, well, you're only 19 years old and you've got to have your parents' signature. So I went back home to get my parents' signature and, and my dad said he would sign. My mother looked me straight in the eye and she said, son, she said, I'll only sign on one condition, that you promise to be a Christian soldier. And she said that with tears in her eyes. Well, I, I told her I would do my best. And so I joined. And I had many times when I was very tempted to do things I knew that I shouldn't do. And I knew that if I did, that she would be uh, very unhappy with me. And, uh, and I didn't want to dishonor her. And I, above all, I didn't want to dishonor God. So that's the way I lived my life throughout my military service. And so when I got into the military service, I thought, well, you know, what am I really doing here when I first went in? I'm glad I had my brother with me because I'd have probably went home AWOL or something like that because uh, we enlisted in an outfit that was supposed to be mechanized, but when we got there, they weren't mechanized. We walked and we walked and we, tr <laughs> we were laying out there in the dust and dirt and everything, and it was just miserable training. And a lot of the guys got the flu at that time. This was in early 1940 or late 1940. And my brother got the flu, and the, it was just a miserable time, and I was just about ready to go over the hill, but my brother encouraged me not to. So anyway, I'm glad he kept me in, but uh, we had all of our jujitsu training and all this stuff, amphibious training, jungle training and everything, and they put us in khaki uniforms and all this stuff. We went down to Camp Pendleton, which is a marine base off of uh, California coast, and we did our amphibious landings and so forth. And they brought us back up to Fort Ord, California. They put us on a train and they sent us clear across the United States in khaki uniforms. And we, uh, we, we thought that we were training to go to the Pacific. Well, we got Camp Pickett, Virginia. First thing they did, they put us in uniforms, OD uniforms, they were all impregnated. They said they had to be impregnated because they were afraid that the next enemy we met, or the enemy that we meet over in seas would have gas, and so they wanted to make sure that we weren't going to get burned by the gas. And then we went overseas in a sh ship called the USS Henry, got close to the, they gave us French translation books. Well, we we're kind of naive. We looked at, the, we, uh, we thought we were going to France. We had French translation books, but we got off of the coast of Africa, and they finally told us we were going to French Morocco. That's how we found out there was another country that spoke French besides uh, France. And so when we got there, we were in for the shock of our life. We felt like we went back about 500 years when we got off of that boat. And of course, we were under fire and all that kind of stuff. But uh, when we got up into the land there, my golly, we saw Arabs out there with plows, that, wooden plows. and horses pulling them and a guy leading them and, and they were all cutting the dirt about so deep and uh, we felt like we'd went back 500 years. And the country was so far backward, we wondered what in the world we were doing over there. And we had enough desert here and when we started fighting across the deserts of Africa, we thought we got more desert than this in California, but then uh, we had to go fight for it. and. Actually, we were at the Casablanca Conference, uh, at, and uh, I was supposed to be an honor guard there. My brother and I happened to be in, in the same uh, uh, unit at that time, and, and uh, we were the honor guard, and President Roosevelt's coming down the street. He's looking at the soldiers on both sides, and he says, these are mighty fine-looking soldiers and make good replacements for the 1st Infantry Division. So we got transferred to the 1st Infantry Division, and we ended up there in North Africa with the 1st Division, and we got into a big firefight. Now, talking about what my mother had told me about Christianity, I might tell you that I had a friend who, you know, when I first went in, like I said, I was kind of naive. I didn't know people very well. And uh, he, when he first went in, I, I thought I hated him or something, but then I found out, you know, well, my mother told me if I hated him, she'd wash my mouth out with soap, so I figured I better stop that. But I became very good friends with him, but I asked him to go to church with me. And he said, well, I'm an atheist. And I said, well, that's OK. You can go to church with me. So he went to church with me and came out. And he said, I'm still an atheist. And I said, well, you can be anything you want to be. And I said, uh, uh, fine. Uh, 
when we got to Africa, while we were out there, and we are up on a hill there, and we're digging in. And he's got his old trench shovel, and he's going there, and he's going, uh, and he's just a hitting the dirt like this, and he said, oh, God, help me, oh, God, help me, you know. I, you know, I said to Pete, and I said, afterwards, um, Pete, Pete, didn't you tell me you were an atheist? He says, I am an atheist. Well, I said, well, how come you were asking God to help you? He said, there was no one else to ask to help me. <laughs> so uh, I found out real early in my life in the military service that really there's a lot of people that believed in Christianity. They just didn't know it until it came to the real test of their willpower and everything like that. They, need to, they needed the extra help, and they did ask God for it. And so I find that most of our soldiers are very Christian. And uh, we were fighting for God and country. Now, when we got to, uh, my brother got wounded in Sicily. I'm going kind of fast, I've got to go so cover a lot of land here. Uh, he got wounded and medevac back to Africa. And of course, I finished up the war in Sicily and went with my division around to uh, the, uh, to England and we got into England and there in England we had all this more amphibious training and everything and my brother rejoined us in November of 1943 and then uh, we had all this amphibious training there and we got prepared and in March of 1944 they separated us. They, because of the Sullivan brother incident in the Pacific they decided they had to separate all brothers who were going into uh, battle of where they expected heavy casualties. And the company commander called us in and said, there's three things I gotta tell you. One is we expect about 50% casualties on our next invasion. Well, we, we just figured he was estimating, you know, because he had to estimate something. And uh, he said, you only have $5,000 insurance, which we should increase it. So we increased it to the maximum, which then was 10,000. We got our insurance and then we were separated. I went to company L and I had all new men, and uh, I had to train them. I didn't know any of them in the company, so I was really uh, kind of a loner there, and, but I got the guys trained. Then we got ready to go down to uh, Weymouth, uh, where we were gonna disembark from in England there, and when we got out there, and we were going across the fields, we saw so many tanks, so many trucks, and so many vehicles. We never knew that our country had so much in, uh, uh, during the war, had made so many vehicles because we were starving for them over in Africa and Sicily. We could hardly get any new uh, vehicles of any kind or guns either. And uh, when we got there, they had all kinds of it. And out in the warehouses when we got there, they were stuffed full of logistical supplies for the invasion of Normandy. And then we were put on boats. We, we had a talk by Eisenhower there who explained to us that this was going to be a pretty heavy maneuver here and so forth. And, and uh, that was the last time that I had a chance to talk to my brother. And we got on uh, our boats and he went on uh, his company boat and I went on mine. We were on LS, LCIs, which were called landing craft infantry. And it had 200 men on them. And you, this boat did not go in the first wave because it had 200 men and they had to have the beaches cleared because if you hit that boat, you'd, kill out, you'd knock out about 200 men at a time. So anyway, uh, the first wave got pinned down. We didn't know that was going to happen. And uh, we could, when we were going over there, we were out there in the water following them. And, uh, and then we had to wait and for our turn to go in. And, we got the word that the first wave got pinned down on the beach. Well, they brought back Higgins boats and my squad got called off to be one of the troops that was gonna be sent in to join the first wave. So we were taken off of the uh, second wave boat and we put on the Higgins boat and we went in and landed just like the first wave except we weren't prepared for the chaos that we saw on the beach. It was just absolutely horrendous. If you've ever seen Saving Private Ryan, it was about 60 times worse than what you've seen in Saving Private Ryan because there was so many casualties, so much uh, uh, equipment and uh, stuff on, laying on the beach and men. It was just unbelievable to see. 
And when my squad and I ran, uh, the, our boat stopped in the water out there. The ramp goes down, we're out there, and there's about 100 yards of water ahead of us. And I said, this is as far as we're going. He said, yes, and they let the ramp down. We go out the front of it, and I go into water up to my neck. I thought this is a funny boat, but uh, it couldn't go any farther up to the beach. But anyway, um, we, we got up to uh, on the beach, and the, f the first thing my men wanted to do was to dig in. But there was a lieutenant up there who's uh, directing traffic, and, uh, and I heard that uh, I was supposed to go in and take a no uh, reconnaissance uh, of uh, Triviers, uh, my squad was supposed to do a reconnaissance patrol at uh, Triviers, which was about six miles inland. Well, here we are on the beach amongst all these people who were laying around there dead and, and were being fired upon and everything like this. And I said to the lieutenant, uh, uh, I said, what direction we go from here? He was directing traffic. And I said, he said, well, follow that path. If you go to the right or left of it, you'll step on mines. Well, I believed him because I saw these people laying right and left of these paths, but we followed the path. We got up there, there was a last row of wire there that hadn't been blown, so we pulled. There's two Bangalore torpedo men there who had blown the previous wire, and I said, well, we've got to uh, get out of here. And uh, so I asked, the, uh, they asked them to blow the wire for us. They said, we can't, we move. Every time we move, we get shot at by the sniper. And so I said, where is it coming from? And, they pointed in a general direction, so I said, well, we'll lay down a field of fire. So we did. We were firing up there in the hills, and the guys got up to move to let blow the wire. They got the torpedo under the wire. One guy got killed going up to it, and the other one, they, they had him pinned down all right, but and he got killed. The other one did get the wire blown. We don't know what happened to him because he blew the wire, and as soon as he blew it, I rushed my squad through it. We got up on the other side of the wire, and there weren't any more mines, but we got up into the trenches with the Germans. And the first day there, we captured four Germans and sent them down for interrogation. And what the rest that we couldn't capture, they either got away from us or they got killed. And uh, we captured the pillbox from the rear. We kept on fighting. We got into the hedgerows later. and. Uh, on the 9th, on the 7th of June, uh, night of the 7th, we had a patrol. We had a perimeter out there. We put up a you know, defense perimeter, and, uh, and we had to have a rest. And so we're just laying there, and all of a sudden, just firing goes on, and the German patrol ran into our uh, perimeter. But we couldn't fire them after they got into the perimeter. We had to let them go. And so they wanted somebody to follow them out. Well. My squad got the job. I don't know how that happened, but we got the job. And we followed out. And uh, we were going down this road, and it was dark, pitch dark. We couldn't see. And, uh, but we did stumble upon a briefcase that a guy was apparently carrying when he went in there. And it was, uh, we picked it up and brought it back. I said, we can't go any further. We can't see where we're going. We don't know where we're going. And uh, we went back to the CP. They opened it up and they found the second and third lines of defense uh, the Germans were going to retreat to when they retreated from the uh, trenches on the, uh, from the beachhead. So uh, next day, the, on the seventh, on the, uh, well, uh, next day we did a lot of fighting. The next day was on the ninth and tenth is for the action for which I received my Medal of Honor. And on that day, we were we had a platoon in one field going up here, and they got fired upon. And we hadn't gotten fired on our side yet, but so I I didn't want to get caught out in the middle of the field with my men. So I rushed them all up to the edge row in front of us, so we'd have some kind of protection. And then I I was the leader of the squad. I always led my men because none of them had a battle experience before. And besides that, I could smell the Germans before I could see them anyway. And so I took the lead, I went down there, and I was going up along the hedgerow, and suddenly I, I heard this noise on the other side, and I ran up on the hedgerow, and here's four Germans with their guns pointed at me, and there's a machine gun firing up in the corner. Now I had to make a quick decision whether I was going to shoot them, capture them, or something. Well, I knew I couldn't they'd capture them because uh, uh, they would have shot me. So they had to drop on me, but I. I had a drop on them too, but I pulled my triggers faster. So 
I killed the poor man and I went up the hedgerow and got out, ran out of the hedgerow into onto the top of a machine gun nest and knocked it out. Went up the hedgerow further on and then there was another machine gun firing. And we did the same thing essentially, except that I had my men all fixed their bayonets when I was that close to those men. They were about from here to this first row in front of me when I shot them. And uh, so, uh, and when you, an M1 rifle, when that clip goes out, you gotta reload it. And if they started to charge you or something, you might not get the thing reloaded, so you have to be ready for them. So I had them to fix their bayonets so they would be ready in case they ran out of ammo. And uh, then when we got up there, I, when we knocked out the next machine gun nest, I ran up on the remote hill there. It was kind of where they'd cleared something off there, and I didn't know what it was for. But uh, lo and behold, on the other side, in a defilated area there, there was uh, two big mortar positions going into place. Well, they actually, they were in place. They were, had been firing them. And there were 12 men with them. And uh, they looked at us, and their eyes got big, and they got scared. Well, we were scared, too. We didn't know what the heck to do. But uh, we asked them to halt. They wouldn't halt, so we had to start shooting. And we knocked out the uh, German section there. And uh, that was uh, that day. And then on the 10th of June, we got involved in another hedgerow thing, going, doing the same thing, practically, going up along the hedgerow when they attacked us from three sides, there was the hill, the, the field on that side over there, and the field on that side, and both in the front. And the company commander told us to withdraw. So I turned her, I told my men, I said, well, we can't do that. If we turn our backs on, they'll shoot us all in the back. So I went up on the mound and I said, we'll fire cover for you too, uh, so you can withdraw while we fire uh, on the enemy. So, uh, my automatic rifleman came up with me and he was firing on around to the right and I was firing to the left. And we kept him pinned down. The, guy, the rest of the squad got behind us, got back. One man got killed up in the hedgerow. Uh, as we were going back, I saw him putting a machine gun down there and so I'm firing on it and I got hit in the back from some guy behind me like I thought would happen in the first place. And it spun me around and I saw a German up there. I, just, I was falling down with port arms and I just shot him. And then uh, I got up and I saw my BAR man laying up there on the field. So I ran up and I got him. He had been hit in the leg, the right leg and the right arm and he couldn't use it. And so I had to get him up and put his arm over my shoulder and carry him back to the hedgerow behind me. And then I went back and got his rifle. And that's the way I, that was the action for which I received the Medal of Honor, but I didn't get it for that day. Uh, you know, I, you don't get them right away out in the field. I didn't know I was going to get a Medal of Honor for any of that action. But I refused to have my, and when I got back, I refused to have my wound dressed. They looked at my pack and they said, my company commander, uh, when they uh, were loading the riflemen on the ambulance, I said, well, you better have the medics check the, my wound in my back. So they took off my back and they found where a bullet hit my back and went in my muscle and out and into my pack, hit a bar of soap, went through my mother's picture in the back there, uh, the side of it anyway, and uh, came out my trench shovel. When the officer turned me around, he said, my God, you should be dead. You've been shot clear through. I said, oh, no. That's, so they took it off. That's what they found. And uh, then uh, I refused to be medevaced. I got my bandoliers, went on, kept on fighting, and I got wounded again later. Then I went to Cherbourg Hospital, got wounded again later, went up to Hurricane Force, and I got wounded up there. I was in, after we fought in Belgium, and then through, uh, we were in Germany. And I got wounded to Hurricane Force, and I came back in, uh, that was in October, and I came back in November. And uh, I was reading in the Stars and Stripes. My a friend on the uh, train was reading the Stars and Stripes. He says, A. Ehlers, I'm reading here where your brother got the Medal of Honor. And I said, yeah, I'm reading that too. But I didn't tell him he was reading about me because I hadn't gotten it yet. And so uh, besides, my brother got killed on D-Day on, on the uh, second wave and he came in on that LCI. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, 
when I got back to the uh, CP, I got off of the train and was going up to CP, and a colonel called me by my last name. He said, Sergeant Ehlers, what are you doing here? I said, sir, I am reporting back to duty. He says, well, you're supposed to be back in, Par uh, back in the United States getting the Medal of Honor from the president. And I said, yes, sir, I read about it in the Stars and Stripes. <laughs> That's how I found out I was going to get it. Well, the Battle of the Bulge started. The Battle of the Bulge started on the 16th. And uh, I had already been promoted to a second lieutenant on the 9th of June, or 9th of December, rather. And uh, we got a battlefield permission, uh, commission, and uh, General Hubner gave it to me for being so nice to his press. <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, he told me I qualified. I told him I didn't. I, thought, I didn't think I did, but when he said I did, why well, I had to accept. And then they called me out on the night of the 16th, I think it was something like that. And they said, uh, Lieutenant Ehlers, they called me at 2 o'clock in the morning. I said, They're getting me out of bed. They said, uh, We got to get you out of here. I said, What's the big hurry? They said, Well, the Germans have landed uh, troops behind our lines, and they are also infiltrating our lines with uh, Germans in American uniforms speaking perfect English. And we want to get you back to Paris to get your Medal of Honor before you get killed. I said, well, that's <laughs> all right with me. So I did. I, I went back, and they told me when I got back to Paris that, well, we're going to send you home for 30 days, not because you have the Medal of Honor, but because you have more points than anybody in the division had. Well, I figured that's not so either, but uh, I went home because I had the medal. But anyway, I did get go home for 30 days. I came back, I rejoined them, and I uh, was with them and fought through Remington Bridgehead and went on uh, later on. Got wounded again in April 1945, but I made it to the end of the war, and uh, we met the Russians in Czechoslovakia. That's Great. the truth. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Ehlers, for that uh, fairly complete account. And our next panelist is uh, Captain Joachim Wedekind, uh, former German uh, civilian uh, Navy. OK. I have the difficult task of talking about something non-military, civilian. Uh, this is about German merchant marine in service for the Navy throughout the war. Uh, I started uh, my career at 15 years of age on a square rigger, on one of these old sailing ships that grew all over the world without engines. And then the war started in 1939. And at the beginning of 1940, the Navy started to uh, set up special offices uh, just uh, strictly for uh, military supplies, the so-called troop transport ships. And uh, we went all over Europe. It's, uh, I wanted to do this with a map, but I couldn't get that uh, set up that way in order to show uh, the places where the, we had to do that. It started with Norway in April 1940. Uh, we occupied Norway and in the, uh, okay, I have to start to explain how this works. These were normal freighters, uh, any time, any tonnage from uh, 4,000 to above any kind of tonnage. And they had, not like nowadays where everything goes in containers, we had breakboard cargo ships, uh, steamships mostly, either diesel or coal ships still. And they had just ordinary cargo hatches. They were prepared for taking ammunition, tanks, uh, gasoline, in the holds and uh, all kind of equipment. And in the case of Norway, we had horses on board. 
um, on deck and the two upper twin deck and on deck we had soldiers and also equipment. And in the case of Norway action, we started out of Hamburg, fully loaded with military equipment and the soldiers on board. And we entered the uh, uh, Oslo Fjord on 14th of April, 40. At that time, uh, in front of us was a convoy which included a German cruiser, uh, Blücher, and it was sunk about six days before we arrived up there. We got a torpedo, and we were lucky enough to set the ship on a, on a rock. But then the problem was to get the soldiers off and the equipment, and unfortunately the 52 horses we had on board. And so that was the first experience. And then after a while, I went with a freighter to North Sweden, to Lulia, and uh, Leningrad. That was a time when Germany had not entered Russia yet. And uh, when I came back from Leningrad, the Navy sent me to France. At this was in August 1940, and it was a, we didn't know what it was all about. Uh, the ships in saint Nazaire and Le Havre were prepared for, to be troop transports. And the, it was, the whole operation was named uh, Sea Lion. And it was supposed to be an in, 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 uh, invasion of England. And in fact, we were all out fully loaded with all kinds of ships and smaller, larger ships. And uh, we were ready to um, get the convoys together. And the uh, several warships came along as protective uh, ships for the convoy. And then all of a sudden, it was canceled. And we went back to port and unloaded everything. And that was the time when Hitler had decided not to invade England. From there, I went to North, uh, to the Mediterranean. And the Mediterranean theater was mainly for troop transports to supply the Africa Corps from several Italian ports mainly Sicily, Napoli, uh, several ports on the East Coast. And uh, same thing. We were loading uh, tanks, ammunition, all kind of military equipment, and soldiers. And some of we always felt sorry for them because most of the soldiers had never seen a ship in their life. And then we got out and it was kind of, the whole thing was blockade running. Because you have to visualize Italy in the north, the North African theater in the, north, in the south, and the British coming with their convoys from Gibraltar, west east to go to Cairo and Alexandria. Their convoys were comprised of something like 40, 50 ships battleships, cruisers, and we had uh, Italian uh, smaller warships as protection, and we were going north-south, maybe with eight or ten ships or something. Sometimes there wasn't much of a chance. Plus that we had to pass close to Malta, and Malta had a very good uh, uh, base there for their Bristol Blenheim airplanes. And what they did is when they attacked us at sea, they were going off. Oh, I have to mention that we did have anti-aircraft on board, usually one on the stern, one on the bow. But when an airplane came very low, like something like 100 or 200 feet above the water, 
and then pulled up at the last moment. Sometimes they even took our antenna away. Uh, you could not reach them with our guns. They were too low. The guns didn't go that low. So that's why many of them just got away. So I did that for 1940, 41, and 42. In the beginning of, let me see, when we were uh, starting to, to, to prepare the ships for troop transports in ports like Genova and Trieste and Venice, at that time, Rommel wasn't in Africa yet. He came about three months later. And then we started with equipment such as Volkswagen, very light tanks, and uh, very, very, uh, and the, the, we heard later on that, for example, the Volkswagen were uh, built up with plywood to look like tanks. And Rommel sometimes used them to run up and down the horizon to, <laughs> to let the British show that there were German tanks involved. But then we didn't have tanks in Africa yet. And uh, then, uh, so we went up and down north, south, and lost many of our ships. And uh, there were some interesting things that happened that I remember. For example, uh, at night time, every night at 10 o'clock, we had a German radio station out of Belgrano that was sending the Lily Marlene, sung by Lala Anderson. And so everybody was sitting on their orange crates there listening to Lily Marlene. It was kind of an Africa core melody. And one day, we took British prisoners from Tripoli back to Napoli. And we sat down with them and talked to them. They were all av aviators. And then somebody mentioned about the Lily Marlene. Oh, no, it came on the radio. It was late at night. So that man also, his ears perked up and said, oh, that was a time when we sat down and listened at your radio station. <laughs> and in fact, at 10 o'clock at night, there was no fighting going on. They both sat there and listened to the Lady Marlene. And uh, so then sometimes uh, we also, I also went to Greece and Crete. Uh, we were the first supply ship going into Crete after uh, the, uh, the parachute uh, soldiers had landed there and taken over. So after that, to, I tried to make it short because there is so much to talk about if you really want to. Uh, from there, I went back to the north, to the Baltic Sea, and still under Navy orders and uh, just merchant ships. And one of the things I did was uh, the 24th the uh, U flotilla in Mamel, they needed targets for their commanders to be trained and their, their future uh, U boat commanders. And we were the target ship. And we would go out at night and they shot torpedoes at us, but the torpedoes had lights in front. And then they put them in such a way that they went underneath the ship, supposed to. One day the torpedo went in and we just limped into port after that one. But uh, that was one of these more interesting uh, things. But so generally then I wound up in the Baltic uh, in something that I will talk about on Saturday, which has to do with uh, saving the people from the east of Germany, like East Prussia and all that, from the Russian troops that entered. Uh, the, uh, the beginning of 45, and we brought a total of 2.3 million people with ships to the West in four months. That was quite an operation. But like I said, I talk about that on on uh, yeah on Saturday. 
So that's about generally trying to explain the merchant marine. Yeah, time is really advancing, and uh, we got about 15 to 20 minutes left, so I would like to open this panel discussions for, for Q&A from our distinguished audience. Questions, please. Madam. Could you please repeat the question, madam, please? Over the mic, yeah. I would like to ask Mrs. Bozak if she has the same feeling of uh, sort of being an outsider as far as being a veteran is concerned that Mrs. Ringenberger had. If I have the same feelings as what I'm a little... Uh, Mrs. Ringenberg said that she sort of felt like an outsider and was not quite sure that she was really a veteran. Oh, oh. well... Uh, I believe that you didn't get veteran status from the very beginning, right? Right. They didn't get, just like the merchant marines, they didn't yeah. get veteran status until just recently. Yeah. I know the uh, lady marines did not either, uh, but I believe the, was the wax different? Did you get veteran status right away? Well, when we first went in, when we had the auxiliary, uh, we were not. We were not considered anything, <laughs> but uh, when General Eisenhower came in June of 1943, I have pictures of the general here reviewing our troops, our, some of our women. I was a member of the 149 WAC headquarters company, which was the first company to go overseas in World War II, and I guess that's the reason why I was invited here which I'm glad, and, uh, and, uh, and so at the time we had a director, Ovira Harvey from Texas. She went over there and we were given a choice. We were given a choice to remain, to remain there and become part of the army, so to speak. Not like the army of today, but our army in those days, which was altogether different. But a lot of the women chose not to re-enlist, and they didn't want to become WAC, so they came home. But after that, we had all the benefits and privileges of the regular army. Of course, the pay in those days, you know what it was like. Thank <laughs> does, you. That, does that answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Next question, please. Sir. I'd, I'd like to ask Mr. Ehlers if he could talk about um, the bond that existed between him and his squad mates, and if you could also mention some of the qualities of leadership that uh, make an outstanding small unit leader. Well, it, it takes a lot of training. Uh, you know, I was in the service for two years before the war started, so I had a lot of training before uh, I ever became a squad leader. And of course, I, I didn't get any promotions until I was overseas, and uh, uh, and I guess by uh, demonstration, I was able to show that I was a, a leader. But I got promoted to a corporal, and then I got promoted to a sergeant, and I never at any time did I ever know when I got a certificate. I didn't know when I was promoted or what the dates were, anything like that, until I became a second lieutenant. That's the only time I ever found out what date I was really promoted. <laughs> but uh, uh, so uh, uh, we didn't have any uh, leadership training other than what we had in combat there. And uh, we had it, we got it the uh, hard way. But uh, leadership training is very important uh, for anybody going into the military service. That's the reason our ROTC programs are such a good program throughout the United States is because they teach leadership and uh, training in that. And that's what we need. No, we, 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 uh, in America, we weren't short leaders because we could just, just about count on anybody to take over if they, if they needed to. 
that was one thing about American soldiers, that they were all very capable of becoming a leader. Thank you. Question, perhaps to Mrs. Ringenberg? Sir, oh, madam. <laughs> I don't really have a question, but as a female, I would like to say, and I'm going to compliment the females, how, how in awe and, and how much we admire you for what you did. And uh, usually the female does not get the so-called credit. And so I just wanted to say how much we enjoyed hearing you and being here, and thank you for all that you did. You're absolutely right, and I share that, because uh, there's a saying that General Patton said, wars may be fought by weapons, but they're won by men, and I may add, also by women. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you. We got, uh, we got time for another two or three questions, please. To Captain Vedekin, uh, in the American Merchant Marine, when we were traveling either alone or in convoy, we used a zigzag uh, method of traveling so that we could avoid the uh, German submarines. Did you all use the same sort of uh, tactics in, in a German Merchant Marine? Yes, we did. Uh, sometimes uh, it resulted in accidents because you know how difficult that is to navigate a ship between other set clothes. Plus the fact that we could not uh, communicate by radio with each other. Radio was a no-no during the war. And uh, so we had to signal by light, or, you know, uh, Morse signals, or uh, the flag signals by hand. So it wasn't, but we did sometimes, if there was enough space. Yes, please. <clears throat> if I may hear from the ladies, I know that you had mentioned this idea of, you know, uh, Miss Ringberg, I think she said, you know, you could get married, you could be a, a nurse, you could be a teacher. After the war, um, with your experiences, what did you go on to do after that? I didn't quite follow the question. Yeah. Could, could you repeat the question, sure. please? Um, given the experiences that you had in the war, uh, when you, I guess, sort of discovered that you could be more than a teacher, more than uh, a waitress, um, what did you do with those experiences after the war, what did you um, go on to, to do? I came back and was a flight instructor. I still have my flight instructor's rating and uh, I, I'm proud of my students that I had. It wasn't, it wasn't easy getting the students in the first place, but uh, once I got them, I've got them all over the world. Okay, I have a question for you, Ms. Ringenberg. How many hours do you have, and do you still accept students? <laughs> uh, I do biannual flight reviews, and those that need to be upgraded on instruments or multi-engine, I have the examiner ratings on them. But uh, I'm not actively getting in and out of an airplane is harder than flying them. <laughs> I have I have over forty thousand hours flying time. That's a lot of sitting. There was a question over there. Yes. Oh, uh, for the captain, uh, Captain, just want to know what did the average German mariner think of Adolf Hitler and the Nazis when you were on the high seas? Did you ever have time to think about that sort of what he was ranting about, or just did, did you have we? political folks in any way, or what, what do you think all that, it, that it's a It's a good question. Uh, generally, in the Merchant Marine, as well as Navy, there was quite a resistance to Hitler. And uh, in fact, they have tried to get some political motivated young officers into the ships, you know, and you, after a while, you know right away, especially if it's a small crew, who it is, he didn't stay on board very long. <laughs> no, we, uh, generally people were not, because it's, 
in the nature of Merchant Marine. You go all over the world, you meet other people, and you come back and get into something like this where you have no, you're not allowed to listen even at foreign radios or something. You only are allowed to read the local newspaper, you know, made by Dr. Goebbels. And uh, so you learn not to believe anything anymore yeah. when it gets to that. And no, we didn't have generally any problems with that. Captain Wade, again, one quick question for you. You mentioned the 52 horses that were your cargo during the invasion of Norway. What happened to them? We had to shoot most of them <laughs> because uh -huh. they got hurt. I mean, you cannot win a horse once it is. Yeah. And, and many of them died in the water. I mean, the, the holes immediately filled with water where they were down there. Mm -hmm. And some of them we got out, but they had to be shot by the by their uh, attendants because you can't when a horse is hurt that badly especially when it can't stand up anymore you, you have to shoot it mm -hmm. i had a question for mr ehlers uh, you had touched on the d-day in, uh, invasion and the accuracy of movies such as saving private ryan are there aspects of that invasion that you think have never accurately been captured on film uh, well, I think they did a pretty jo good job of accurately capturing what was actually happening on the beach and things like this, so, except they did some over-exaggeration in some scenes like where they showed a heck of a lot of blood in the water on the beaches where it, you don't, blood doesn't stay on the beach. It uh, washes away. As soon as a wave comes in, the water goes out, and then all that stuff goes with it. So there, you, you didn't see that kind of stuff, uh, unless you happened to be there when the blood all of a sudden poured out of somebody. But otherwise, you would never see it. Uh, they, they did that. That's exaggeration. And Saving Private Ryan, uh, going across the field and looking for a a, uh, a young man in, a, in another unit and they're out there in no man's land and talking to one another back and forth like there was nobody around them it was a very dangerous thing to do. It's a good way to get yourself killed out in the fields. So I don't think the, we never went across the fields talking like that to one another. We didn't have time for <laughs> We didn't want to get killed. Uh, so there, there were a lot of things, that, uh, a few things, but it was a pretty good, it's a, it's a good movie. The, the nice thing about Saving Private Ryan, it did show the humanitarian thing. It showed how the mothers who suffered as a result of the war, in other words, here the first scene in the movie was that this army vehicle was coming down the road to this farmhouse and this mother sitting on her porch and she finally sits down and she knows she's going to receive bad news, but she didn't know she's going to receive bad news about losing four of her brothers in one accident, you know, something like that. And, and that's, uh, that's hair raising. And uh, a lot of mothers went through that during World War II. My mother had three boys in the service. One got killed. She had two son-in-laws. They both survived. So, but uh, uh, it, it's a r rough world out there for mothers who have to provide the armed forces with the soldiers and sailors and so forth uh, that uh, do face this battle situations like this. Thank you. Uh, to conclude uh, tonight's session, I have a very brief personal question to all four panelists. Out of your personal World War II experience, what is your personal message to the present American youth and to the world's young generations? Well, I think it's very, very important for us to be mentors to the schools and, and speak at the schools. And I do probably 20 to 25 a year because those students need to know that we had a good life and it was a good time and they too can be part of the greatest generation if they apply themselves. Thank you. Captain Vidikin. I didn't think much about it because, you know, it's so long ago, but I would say uh, I wouldn't go through that again. 
for anything in the world. I mean, it's so senseless. Yeah. It just, okay. I don't know. Yeah. Mrs. Uh, Bozak? Well, it seems like everything I do is veteran oriented. And uh, doing my volunteer work for 18 years, we help the veterans. We uh, have parties for the patients at the Miami VA General Hospital. And we try to help the veterans in every way. Uh, during the pro uh, at the private sector, I don't think I've contributed anything to that. But when it comes to veterans, I'm right in there helping them uh, in every way we can. That's why I guess I, I'm a life member, like I said, of everything. Thank you. And Mr. Ehlers, please. What I did since the war. Excuse me? You're talking about what I did since the war? No, what? I mean, uh, the person, my personal question to you was, be, uh, what, what is your personal message to the youth out of your World War II experience? To the oh, youth. My personal message to the unit here? To the youth, to the younger generation. To the youth? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I had, uh, my personal message to the youth, I talk to them all the time. Uh, first of all, uh, I, you know, I worked for the Veterans Administration for 30 years, and uh, I inter interviewed veterans, and I retired in 1980. Ever since that time, I've been talking to the youth of America. And my message to them is to, um, to believe in our country, and uh, first of all, uh, that the Constitution of the United States is the best constitutional government in the world. It survived the longest of any government, and that it is worth saving, and that uh, we should all work at it, and it's in their hands now. Uh, as we, each generation passes on, they got the responsibility of carrying that on, and I think they should really study the history of the world, and, and they will really find out that uh, this is the greatest country that has ever been uh, uh, in existence because we've freed more people in our short time of history than any other country in the world has. Thank you very much. Thank you all for you. Thank you to our audiences for being with us tonight. Thank you.